Hello guys and welcome to my necromancer class. Don't forget to support original author AER0182. Now let's get to the next chapters. Hope you enjoy. Chapter 151. Matheson was guarding the southeast side of the village, baiting much stronger enemies into a spell storm to kill them, comma, but this would only go on for so long. The magical storm was shrinking. Hum, I'll be running soon enough. He gave a concerned look at the quickly shrinking cloud. Shit he exhaled as he saw something dangerous. Amongst some deep groans of wood, there was a lot of movement in the forest, comma, a force of five treants were wandering through it slowly. And that was when they saw Matheson, to the treants he was merely a fluid-filled snack during their nest expansion conquest. Easy pickings. Matheson froze, hoping his movement wouldn't attract them. But he was only grasping at straws, comma, they immediately charged. Five treat hectopods were bearing down on him, each of them as fast as skeletons. As part of his training, Matheson had been running all this time, comma, sprinting up the hill to the Adventurer Association, running through Lossler to dungeons, running around inside the dungeons. His dexterity stat was also quite high too. It's where he put most of his points due to his rapier class. But he was still nowhere near as fast as these creatures. They would catch him, it was only a matter of time. Meanwhile, the storm was shrinking rapidly. He simply couldn't rely on it any longer. Against five of them he only had one choice, comma two run. There was no wall around Losler, and no fences either. Matheson could simply run right in between the houses, and let the treats smash and destroy the peasant houses to their heart's content, while he easily escaped. Hem he considered it for a moment. He truly didn't care about some weak peasants, comma, but he remembered what his father was like. I would definitely be blamed for that, and my father would find out eventually. He would find a way to punish me. Perhaps take away my weapons just to slow down my development TCH. Seems like I have no choice. He gritted his teeth and sprinted off comma, but not between the houses to safety. Matheson wouldn't have minded if the creatures did smash up the dirty looking houses of the peasants. But it seemed for now, that he would have to run between the spell storm, and the south side of lossless houses heading back west. As he passed by the houses, he noticed some faces in the windows, gazing at him in awe. They looked at him like he was their hero. What the hell are they looking at? Their faces look so different, he thought as he ran. Since he didn't understand their hopeful gazes, their looks only made him angrier. A strange feeling went over Matheson as he ran each time he passed a house. He saw some hopeful eyes gazing at him. The people he considered peasants were looking at him as if they loved him. He had never felt such a strange feeling. It was different from every other smile he had seen. The shit-eating grin of a political enemy. The proud smile of other nobles. The fake smile of people trying to please him. The disdainful smile of a manipulative friend. The mocking smiles of the guards. The demanding stares from his own father. He then noticed himself slowing down, caught up in his thoughts, comma, this definitely wasn't optimal while he was running for his life. Ugh. Foolish fleeting feelings. Strength is all that matters. He reminded himself, gritting his teeth in anger as he picked up the pace and sprinted faster. This seemed to do the trick, comma, the combination of anger, pain and focus, made the uncomfortable feelings go away. Thankfully, the south path was coming into sight, and there were guards there too. Ho! Oh. He yelled. But due to his rapid breathing, all that came out was a ha. The guards were all quietly preparing for battle. The storm spell would be over soon, and they would have to fight. Some checked their weapons, others chatted, while some simply lay down. Still, it was enough for them to turn their heads to the weird yelling sound. Each of their eyes bulged as they saw Matheson, a young adventurer with five treats bearing down on him. Shit, get up. One yelled, he went to wake up another who was lying down. Huh. The one lying down opened one eye before raising his head up slightly, seeing the fear on the guard's face. Why is he alarmed? He wondered. The group of guards were much higher levels than the treats, spore nests, and other things that charged out of the woods. Meanwhile the spell storm was still active, so it didn't really make sense to be so alarmed, comma, he even looked panicked, which was odd. He looked to where he was pointing, only one eye still open. That's when he saw a young adventurer, comma, quite a muscular one too. Oddly, he didn't have a look of fear on his face, but one of solemn seriousness. His expression was like a mighty boulder, unfazed by the world around him. Next, he saw the charging elementals behind him, and the panic of the other guard made sense. Floosh. 
the guard lying down suddenly disappeared, leaving behind only a faint dark blue glow of mana which quickly dispersed. Fwoosh exclamation point comma shring. He reappeared in the air behind a treant, slicing off its head in one hit. Fwoosh. On the fwoosh. He quickly disappeared and reappeared in between two other treants, slicing at their many legs. Unfortunately, it didn't count as a sneak attack this time. So it didn't critically strike comma the treants stopped charging after they slowed down at least, and thankfully, he grabbed their attention. It's in your hands now, the teleporting guard said quietly as he helplessly shrugged, reaching his limit for teleporting for today. This left two more treants charging at Matheson. But it wasn't looking good for him, comma, the guards were fast, but not fast enough. As Matheson heard one getting close, he immediately pulled out his rapier and dodged to the side. Had he not dodged, he would have been pierced by two pairs of antlers, so instead he opted for one pair. There was no way he was dodging both of them. The sharp, bratch-like tendrils pierced into his side. Ugh. He tried not to scream, only gritting his teeth and growling as blood poured from his body, comma, screaming was for the weak. Of course, he was not done yet. Shring, 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 shring. Even while pierced, he lashed out. Just like that, parts of the antlers were cut off and fell to the ground, comma, but to Matheson's surprise, the pain was just beginning. Each antler that pierced him was moving around like wriggling worms, tearing his flesh and organs apart. Soon, his own organs had started drooping and hanging out of his stomach as he was lifted into the sky. Far, far, he could barely breathe, barely able to even scream as his right lung was completely punctured, and was filling with blood. His eyelids were getting heavy as he struggled to hold onto consciousness, lightly slashing at the treat. At this point, the flame rune in his rapier was doing more damage than his pitiful slashes. S-H-H-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-
It had been pretty slow because of the battle comma, but he expected a rush of guards later in the day though. Lara paid and left as quickly as she came. Now the pub, she thought, secretly glancing at Lannister as she led them towards it. Thankfully, it was mostly on the way towards the Adventurer Association, so it wasn't too suspicious. Hey, I've got to use the washroom, hum. Oh, a pub, give me a moment. Lara said as innocently as possible. Uh, okay, I'll wait out here. Lannister sighed, leaning on a tree. Lara nodded and began walking inside, her crafty smile growing larger with each step. Well, hello there, young lady, a bald moustached man smiled warmly. He greeted her as soon as she opened the door, immediately putting down the glass and moving closer to the middle of the counter, keen to serve the pretty young lady. Wow, what great hospitality you have here. She smiled and approached the counter. Of course, of course. Now, how can I serve you? His eyes sparkled as he looked at the beautiful young woman before him. I would like a beer please. Anything you have will be fine, I'm sure. She smiled back with a wink. Sure, and since you're new here, I'll give it to you for free, on the house. He chuckled, pouring the beer as he continued to smile and stare at her. Wow, what a kind and caring man. She played along, won't you join me for a beer? Devon smiled even more broadly at this, quickly pouring himself a drink comma but, before he could even take a sip, the young lady had already finished hers. Huh, he wondered, seeing her frown. Or, sorry, I drank it too fast she sat silently for a moment making puppy dog eyes. Devon was ready to have a beer with her and share some conversation comma maybe it would lead somewhere. That's what he thought anyway. Oh, well, I suppose I can get you another. He smiled, though a little reluctantly. Hook, line and sinker, thought Lara, having manipulated him into giving her two free beers so far. Thank you so much. She looked at him lovingly, her puppy dog eyes turning to a bright sunny smile. After some more lies woven into some general conversation, some precise body language hinting at something, she had already finished her second beer. Oh no wait, let me pay for another hey I have an idea. I'll buy you one too. She cutely chuckled. Devon happily went to pour another two beers. After a moment, she pulled out some random items from her inventory, frowning each time. Devon was smiling, but it slowly faded, looking at her sorrowfully as he put the fresh beers on the counter. I'm sorry her eyes got watery. It seems I have left my purse at home. I'm so sorry it looks like I'll have to enjoy your company some other time. She looked like she was about to cry. Oh, ah, uh, well he pursed his lips. I guess I could give you another. He chuckled awkwardly with a light smile. Ah, uh, really? Are you sure? She asked hesitatingly, though was already reaching for it. Go ahead, he smiled. So tell me about yourself. How does an angel find themselves here in Losler? He tried to flirt, but was incredibly rusty. He was a middle-aged single dad after all. Lara smiled and went to sip her beer before she asked would comma though it wasn't a sip. It turned into a long drink comma then a chug. The glass didn't leave her lips as she downed the whole thing in one breath. Devon raised a brow seeing this, shocked. She slammed it down, uh, she smiled, delicious. She exhaled, uh, so, Devon began to speak. Laura was already wiping her lips and standing up, her face now neutral and uncaring. Thanks, she simply nodded. Her eyes weren't even watery from when she pretended to cry. Lara's face suddenly turned emotionless as she stood up and quickly left the pub. Devon was shocked. He couldn't say anything as he watched her leave. WH what? What the? His chest felt hollow as he looked at the empty glass before him. He stared at the closed door for a moment longer before starting to shake his head in disbelief. Monster what a monster he shivered, feeling like he had been violated. Tap tap tap. He quickly looked up the hallway, hearing familiar footsteps comma Tamara was coming. Devon grabbed the glasses with the speed of a snakeravan and quickly rinsed them before cleaning them. He was breathing heavily now, not wanting to get caught. He thrusted them into some water to wash out the beer foam. Hey, good enough he thought as he began wiping them with his dish towel. Tap tap tap. He was still polishing one cup, but he froze as he heard her voice. Dad, you're drinking on the job. You're on cleaning duty now. Tamara smiled. I comma, I was not, I was just washing them. I he kept polishing the glass, pressing a little more firmly now. Hum, she dashed at her dad with a smile, stepping behind the bar and leaning in close to him. Stop it. He tried not to smile. Ah, 
I can smell it. Cleaning duty. She grinned. With a sigh and a defeated smile, Devin gave in. Fine, he sighed. He knew he was beat polishing slowly now. That manipulative monster, he thought, shaking his head. Laura casually stepped outside, trying to seem casual. Ahem. She covered up a burp by clearing her throat, approaching Lannister. Let's go. She gestured. Lannister got up and they began walking without talking much at all. Not noticing that Lara was trying to cover up tiny burps as they went. Chapter 153. No way Dan said, slowly raising his axe as he gazed at the tree line. A new monster was emerging. What the dash? What even is that? Huh. Didn't expect to see one of those here. Paul brandished his cloud spear once more. The creature was as tall as most of the trees. Its body was kite shaped. Large logs made a teepee shape around a glowing green core, with smaller branches and sticks, filling the gaps in between. Four thick tree trunk legs attached on each side of it, each of them thumping into the ground, every step slowly driving it forwards. There was an opening at the front of its body, allowing green light to wash out from the glowing green core inside. Its body was like a walking wooden furnace comma of course. There was no fire inside, only the green ball of a plasma-like energy. Jay was not reacting to it like the other adventurers. He was quietly analyzing it, trying to figure out its weak spots, and planning an attack strategy for his human troops, comma, he didn't picture himself attacking the creature, but others working together to bring it down. A necromancer was a natural leader and strategist, and it seemed that his mind was becoming more like that. Of course, there was some conflict in his subconscious human thoughts, comma, a human necromancer, both wanted to work together with others but remain elusive and solitary. Jay could think of a decent strategy in his mind, but verbalizing it and getting the human troops to perform it was another thing. Skeletons were much more efficient in this regard, comma, they would respond directly to his thoughts, carry out the tasks Jay wanted, and would not question them at all. They would only ever disregard one of Jay's thought commands. If Jay had verbally commanded them, comma, his words held more weight. Wait here. We'll finish the nest spore, Paul said confidently as he walked past the adventurers with the other guard in tow. Nest spore, ha, huh? one of the girls mumbled. The other guard followed him. They knew this was something only they could deal with, comma, it was the whole reason they were here, waiting behind the young adventurers. Technically, they were meant to deal with the treats too, but if the young adventurers wanted to test their metal, they had no objection. Jay wanted to analyze the nest spore but he was simply too far away. Paul and the other guard marched towards it, slashing leisurely at the stick balls and nestling gatherers as they went. The nest spore reacted to the approaching threat, stopping its march forward as the green ball of chaotic mana in its belly began to glow brighter, filling with energy. Paul and the other guard paused their march for a moment. It's harmless, Paul said as they kept marching comma it seemed they were analyzing its skills, checking that it wasn't a threatening spell. Duo. A pulse of bright green energy suddenly rippled out across the battlefield, comma, all. The wood elementals froze. The nestlings stopped skittering, and the stick balls stopped rolling. Paul didn't seem to worry too much. He kept clearing a path right to the large wood furnace. Next, the whole battlefield changed, comma, the balls and nestlings all suddenly began moving towards the large furnace. At first they moved slowly and orderly. But it wasn't long before it turned into a mad rush, trampling and rolling over each other. Everyone could guess what would happen next, comma, they tossed themselves straight in. As their bodies entered into the furnace, they immediately disintegrated. Their bodies turned into floating bits of sticks and twigs, before dissolving in the green energy. The green ball of energy inside raged chaotically, as it hungrily ate all the elementals that rushed in. The more that entered, the more it hungered and glowed. Suddenly, the furnace structure closed as multiple branches covered the front, stopping any more elementals from entering. Still, the nestlings and stick balls were trying to get in. It was like they were magnetized to whatever was happening inside. Paul didn't look too worried as they continued to approach it, though they were forced to walk a little more slowly, as the swarm of elementals had grown thicker around the nest spore. Dune. With a deep thud, the nest spore's four legs suddenly dropped its body to the ground, crushing other elementals beneath it. Finally, the branches across the front opened. Its internal green fire had died down back to normal. From out of the mouth of the furnace, a large teardrop-shaped seed grasped at the edges, clawing its way out. It had four of its own legs supporting it, 
Though these were much more spindly and skinny, like young saplings, it seemed that it wasn't meant to walk very far before its legs would become redundant. As it exited the furnace, it had to push back against and even crush some of the stick balls. So it could leave Comer. it was the only elemental that was moving away from the belly of the nest spore. It fought against the elemental tide as it walked away from the next spore. Finding a nice piece of earth, it thrust itself into the ground. Each of its skinny legs then poked up into the sky, sprouting small leaves. Quick, before it grows, Paul pointed, gesturing to the other guard. The other guard nodded, quickly slicing through the tide of wood, as he made his way towards it. He reached it just as the leaves began to grow from its upwards pointing legs. The guard didn't use his personal weapon for this. It was below him, comma, he merely relied on his strength as he swatted and slashed at the elementals. With his heavily abused metal spear, that all the guards were given. Dune, a vertical slash made a large dent in it, pushing the large seed deeper into the ground. Next, a piercing thrust comma he easily bore a hole straight through it. This seemed to do the trick as all the leafy legs which were pointing into the sky, fell to the ground and wilted. The seed was killed before it could even grow. Paul was already casually slashing at the outside of the nest spore, chunks of wood were cleaved off with every hit comma only to be replaced a moment later. Paul didn't panic though, he simply kept slashing. Another one he called to the guard as another four-legged seed exited the furnace. While more stick balls and nestlings hopped right in as if on cue. The guard intercepted the second seed before it even planted itself, ending it in one hit. It seemed like he knew what to do as the guard made it to the mouth of the elemental furnace comma the next seed was pierced and destroyed before it could even leave. Next, he began to kill the stick balls and nestlings. Before they could even dive into the chaotic swirling green energy inside. Paul only nodded, continuing to hack, stab and slash at the outside. Chunks of wood continued to rain off the creature, though they still healed right back. The nest spore was dying though, as the energy inside it got less chaotic and less bright. The more Paul hacked at it, the smaller it got too. Soon enough, its wooden body stopped healing. All four of its legs were hacked off, and the light inside it dwindled. With a few final slashes, parts of the furnace wall opened up, allowing some nestings to jump in. Finally getting to consume more wood, the green light at the center of the furnace grew brighter for a moment, but healed the walls of its body up. Paul looked somewhat dissatisfied seeing this, realizing he had to use more power. He didn't want to use an ability on such a weak creature, but it seemed he had no choice. It simply regenerated too fast. Chapter 154 Looking a little displeased, Paul was forced to use an ability on a nest spore. The ability was far too powerful for such a low-level creature. It felt even a little embarrassing to use it. It felt wrong. It would be like Jay using an unstable tooth spell against an ant. Energy coursed through his hands and into his weapon. His deep blue cloud spear began to radiate with energy. Appearing like it was fuzzy for a moment, comma, then suddenly four other copies of it appeared in the air, floating around it. The spears all seemed to be possessed, having minds of their own, as they all began to wreak havoc on the poor wooden furnace. Slashing and thrusting recklessly, each of them were chaotic, as chaotic as the green energy within the helpless elemental they were destroying. For the nest spore, it was simply too much damage to cope with comma and much too fast. The logs which formed its body, began to tremble and collapse, as its light flickered for a moment. This continued until it just couldn't take it anymore. And after holding on for so long, it suddenly imploded with a final flash. Life left the wood creature, never to return again. Nice work mate. Paul nodded to the other guard as they began to walk back behind Jay's V formation. It was a casual thing for them. This whole time, the adventurers were simply standing around watching comma the swarm of elementals. Had all crowded around the nest spore, so they had no enemies to fight. Temporarily anyway. Some of them were even surprised at how casual the whole thing had been. The veteran guards made it look entirely too simple. Some were even sad at how pathetic the nest spore looked under their sheer power. They expected some kind of valiant life and death battle comma but no, it was simply over with a flash. Jay, along with the other adventurers, had analyzed the whole fight comma not just the boss, but the guards too. Paul and the other guard didn't panic. One of them gave simple orders as the other followed them. They had remained calm during the whole fight, quickly dealing with any problems that sprung up during the battle. 
For some of the more novice adventurers, it was an eye-opening experience. Typically they would panic as soon as one unforeseen event happened during a dungeon, comma, the worst of them acting like Peter, who would turn a simple situation to shit. Jay and his human troops now had to deal with the fallout. The nest spore had not only drawn the elementals in Jay's field towards it, but also from the two fields on each side of them. The other fields were barely left with anything to fight, comma, some of the adventurers from the field on the right, comma, the disorganized bunch even looked on with sneering glances. To the field on the right, it was a good thing, as each of them had been struggling desperately since the beginning. Ignore them, Jay said, seeing Conroy he was being distracted by their glances. P.F. Yeah, they couldn't even bring down a treat. What do they know? He chuckled as he readied himself for battle. It was sadly true. Their guard even had to kill all the treat hectopids that came charging out of the forest. Just by looking at their faces during the battle, Jay could tell they felt a mix of desperation, frustration and shame, comma, though, this was now replaced by looks of jealousy and bitterness. The field with Steven's adventurers on the left was doing just fine, though. With the battle nearly over, most of them looked cheerfully relaxed. They had even managed to kill a treat hectopid themselves. Some of the melee troops even looked longingly at Jay's field. It seemed they still wanted to fight. Their thirst for battle was not quenched. Fighting side by side in an intense battle had made some of them invigorated like extroverts of the fighting world. It was easy to tell what some of them were thinking. More, more, more. The wood elementals had almost formed a small mountain. Balls rolled over each other while the skittering nestlings ran across the tops. The final wave of the wood elementals had gathered comma and it would be focused on Jay and his human troops. There were still more waves of wood elementals moving against other parts of Losler, but it seemed that the weak ones of the northwest had been successfully crushed. All that was left to deal with was this single large wave of enemies. Miss Keep, level 3 dungeon, Losler, Scree. Pain, intense pain. It was the last thing the dehexapod soul eater felt before it died. Perhaps it was a good thing, comma, the only other things it felt were loneliness, hunger and an empty feeling in their souls. Their hearts cried out for something that they couldn't comprehend. Consuming their own kind soul stones, found at the center of the stone statues, would at least make two of these feelings go away, for a moment at least. It was a torturous existence. The dehexapods sensed a familiarity in the stone soldiers, and a sense of longing and sadness moved through them each time. Still, it didn't matter now. They had become monsters as they lost their minds to time. Waiting in the darkness, comma, meanwhile, the stone soldiers had become their enemy, their own minds similarly broken. Perhaps they were not so different. However, whatever familiarity they had and whatever bond they held was broken, lost a time. All that remained was emptiness and hunger. One thing had changed in these unchanging cursed lands. There was a new enemy, comma, the undead. The undead in this dungeon didn't discriminate, ruthlessly hunting both the soldiers and dehexapods alike. It was like they were slowly carving out their own territory which would become a no-go zone. What was odd was that it made no sense why the undead hunted them, comma, they barely had any bones or flesh left, meanwhile the stone soldiers had none, nothing the undead could want, comma, yet they were all cold. It was like they were purely driven by hate. Intense, cold, uncaring hatred. The four skeletons were slaying them with brutal efficiency, comma, it seemed like they were even made for this. Perhaps some higher intelligence had even trained them. First, the carapace of black stone would be shattered by their iron bone hammers. Despite there being four skeletons, they would always hammer at the exact same spot, like they were being guided. If the dehexapids could still think properly, they would have a single thought when fighting them. Where did the undead get fucking hammers and armor from anyway? After a big enough hole was made in the carapace, the skeletons would give up the hammers and use their claw-covered hands, plunging them deep inside their weak black flesh to shred, destroy and extract whatever they could. Somehow, the skeletons knew exactly where to grab every time they would coincidentally find one of its black hearts. As they ripped, tore and sliced one of their black hearts with ease, the dehexapod would take massive damage. The claws on the ends of their skeletal hands were as sharp as their killing instinct. It was like they knew their anatomy. Just how many dehexapods had fallen victim to these skeletons. As the creature would fall to the ground, three of the skeletons would scramble to higher ground on the ruins, comma, looking for their next target. Without so much as a breath, the soul stones were extracted by a single skeleton. 
and the hunt would begin again. Every vessel of consciousness was a target in this dungeon, and soon those vessels would be broken. There was no such thing as rest to the undead. Chapter 155 The elementals now had one motive, one drive left in them, comma, revenge. They didn't care too much about their physical bodies. They could just get another comma, but the treats slain would never rise again, they were bound to the wood. The nest spore was also something that took a lot of time and a lot of cooperation to construct. The elementals weren't foolish beings, but when they inhabited their wooden bodies, they became limited. It was not like they were half wood and half elemental in their wooden bodies. They were still 100% elemental, and at the same time, they were 100% wood, comma, they simply didn't have all the capabilities they would normally have while in their spirit forms, such as higher intelligence. Still, their emotions would respond the same, and right now they felt rage. Without warning, the elementals went for the closest targets they could find. The wave of elementals crashed against the small group of young adventurers, tossing aside any self-preservation as they smashed against them. Brah. Dan the Axeman welcomed the wave of enemies with a roar. Ah, let's switch out again the glaive guy said, ruining the glorious atmosphere, by hiding behind the mace shield guy. Anya had returned to her position on the right of Jay by now and was already sending bolts across the field, ending the nestlings in one hit. As for Peter the lanky bow guy well needless to say, he was out of the battle now. The pain must have been too immense, as all he could do was shake helplessly after his body recovered. The traumatic stress event had ruined him, and he was out of action for now, comma, perhaps, even for the next few days, maybe even weeks well. Who knows how long. The guards expected him to start fighting again after a moment of shaking on the ground. But it turns out he simply couldn't, so they brought him to the back of the field with them. Peter would just get in the way otherwise. Thankfully there were no more treat hectopids to deal with, comma, just a massive swarm. The real battle started with wooden barbed hawks flying viciously across the battlefield. Most were blocked or parried, comma, as for the ones which did land, they were immediately cut at the segmented vine cord. Much more of these hooks were coming at them now, since the nestling gatherers had all grouped up. They also seemed to be attacking faster, comma, some of the adventurers watching correctly guessed that the elementals wanted revenge. Clank, Omathwong, Omadun. The shields were doing an excellent job at blocking them before, but now, there were simply too many. Many elementals were being slain, but the battle only got more intense. Ah, the glaive guy grabbed his shoulder in pain, a hook penetrating deep into it. F fuck, help. He was slowly pulled into the swarm as he grabbed at the mace shield guy in front of him. Hey, stop panicking. The saber girl yelled. The glaive guy grabbed at the mace shield guy, trying to push him into the swarm in a panic. The mace guy couldn't turn around as he was busy blocking hooks left and right comma and this was only made harder with the glaive guy pushing him forward into the swarm. He was like someone who couldn't swim trying to push someone else underwater, so they could keep themselves afloat, comma, it would only serve to drown both of them. Of course, the simple solution would be to trust the person who could swim, but panic had gotten the better of him. He couldn't think clearly at all, as he continued to push the mace shield guy forward, and they were beginning to separate from the group. Jay watched this and began to feel furious. It was a stressful situation made worse. Just let go of him so he can cut the cord, he yelled out. The glaive guy had no answer, his eyes were fixated on the hook in his shoulder, and the nestling slowly reeling him in. Jay decided that he had enough. He could have dashed in, he could have resolved the situation, and bore the cost of this fool's mistakes, taking pain and damage. Of course, the saber girl and the dagger girl will have paid a small price too, taking some extra damage without Jay there. Jay pitied the mace wielder, but made a decision. Leave them, let them perish. They're as good as dead. He said loudly to the whole team, comma, loud enough so that the mace guy could hear. Paul watched on from behind with a sly smile. Next, the mace guy stopped attacking and turned around, comma, he took a few hits from the stick balls for this. But it would be worth it. The mace guy immediately shield bashed the panicky glaive guy. The glaive guy's loose grasp on the mace guy was released, comma, of course. He still tried to claw onto him. Wow, what? Help! He glaive guy yelled. He looked at the mace guy with utter terror and disbelief. The mace guy gave him a bitter look as he calmly sparked and kicked him away. I could have helped if you cooperated. He said coldly as he then proceeded to get back into formation. Seeing this, Jay nodded with a sly smile. At least one of them will be saved, he thought. 
The glaive guy couldn't do anything but shriek as he pulled on the hook comma only, causing it to dig deeper into his flesh. The smaller elementals all had opportunities to pierce and poke him now too. He was now figuratively shitting himself. Hey, I see what you did there. Good decision, mate. Paul said with an approving smile as he rushed past Jay to save the struggling adventurer. Just to teach the glaive guy one final lesson, Paul stood next to him. The glaive guy responded immediately trying to cling to Paul. Still panicked, even though Paul was as calm as ever. Just relax, he calmly said, patting his shoulder. Help, ah, help, he shrieked. The glaive guy was a complete mess, still pulling at the hook, and now he was clinging onto Paul too. Paul just stood there like an unmoving rock. He was too strong to let the glaive guy push or pull him. Slowly, the glaive guy was pulled past him and soon lost his grip, all while Paul didn't move at all. Paul looked disappointed as he shook his head, bitterly watching the panicked adventurer being dragged deeper into the swarm. Chapter 156 With a sigh, Paul dashed in, trampling and crushing elementals around the screaming adventurer, and finally cut the vine cord between the hook and the nestling. He grabbed the glaive guy and put him over his shoulder like a sack of potatoes, and then brought him to the back of the shield. Th thanks. Thank you. He breathed for a moment and caught his breath. Seeing the battle rage on without him, the glaive guy finally got up and went to rejoin the formation comma, but he was stopped in his tracks, a hand grasping his shoulder firmly. It was the other guard. Huh, glaive guy said. Nope, you had your chance. B, but, they let me freaking die. No, they didn't. You're dismissed. Dismissed. What do you mean dismissed? He angrily questioned, not believing it. Dismissed as in go home, you're done for today, the guard said sternly. The glaive guy looked at Paul, hoping he would change his mind. Paul only smiled, go home mate, he pointed to the back of the field. The glaive guy grumbled angrily as he went to the back of the field, kicking sticks and rocks as he went. The mace shield guy returned to formation with a grateful smile, comma, he nodded at Jay, realizing what he did for him. Jay's simple, decisive words had made him realize that he had to abandon the glaive guy. Truly, Jay didn't do anything but help the mace guy to open his eyes to the situation he was in, either he would cut loose the weak link, or perish with it. This is what would have happened in a real dungeon, and both of them realized it. Jay didn't expect a reward or anything, he was just glad to still have his battle formation. Think you can switch out with him for a while? Jay asked Saber Girl as the mace shield guy came back. Sure, she nodded. The Saber Girl had her own shield so she could deflect the flying hawks as well. Ah, shit. I need a hand. Conroy, comma, sword shield guy, said, trying to stay calm. However, you could tell there was some urgency in his voice. A hook had dug into his leg, causing him to stumble for a moment as he was pulled. Just a sec. Dan said, deflecting a hook with his axe. Schwunk. He stepped forward with a quick swing, and the cord was severed. Conroy and Dan hastily moved back into formation. That's what should have happened before. The dagger girl nodded approvingly. Jay was just glad that at least a few people on his team were competent. The mace shield guy wasn't even that bad. He just had a bad teammate. Hum, it's interesting how one idiot can turn a simple problem into a life-threatening situation. Jay thought, casually slashing the stick balls. Throughout this whole fight, Jay had kept his cool. Even when he was being drained and he couldn't see anything, he stayed calm, still slashing away. Jay had even gained Paul's recognition during the fight, comma, taking a leadership role, making a formation, checking on members, and allowing the glaive guy to perish, in order to preserve the rest of the party. The dagger girl realized she was wrong before, when she was thinking about the negative things adventurers would say about Jay when he looked weak. She now realized it wasn't the display of weakness that mattered. But it was how one responded to it, comma, and Jay responded with a calm attitude, getting himself back into top condition, so he could fight as quickly as possible. After all, everyone would show weakness from time to time, even she did during this fight, when the treat slashed her face off. It seemed the qualities of a good leader were resilience. Together they continued to cull the elementals, hundreds of them, comma, but soon enough they were beginning to tire, each of their weapons feeling much heavier. Seeing that the other fields had no enemies left, Jay made a decision. Paul, we could use some backup. He pointed at the other fields. With a nod, Paul went to grab some adventurers from the other fields. Four adventurers followed him back, comma, he brought enough to take some pressure off, but not to make it boring. With him, Stephen tagged along, 
Following them was a ranger to replace Peter and three more melees. Approaching the group, Jay had the three new melees replace himself, the Axeman and the Mace Man. The fresh ferocity of the new adventurers gave them all some breathing room. Now that the team was larger, Jay had control of over 11 people, so he decided to make a new formation. Jay moved safely behind the formation and began to organize them all. For a moment he considered a triangle formation pointing into the swarm, opposite to his V formation. It would break the tide of elementals easily, comma, but that would only be effective for strong enemies that wouldn't die in one hit. What they needed was simply to increase their killing area. With Steven, Dan, Conroy, the mace shield guy, the new ranger around him, he started to tell them the new battle formation. He expected Steven to challenge him, but to his surprise, Steven stayed quiet and simply went along with it, nodding each time. Huh, Jay thought, surprised at how different he seemed. The dot V formation turned into a dot dash. Dash. Formation with Steven and his turrets in the middle. Jay, Dan and Conroy would be in the left melee group, while the maceman and the three new melee guys would be on the right. The Saber Girl and Dagger Girl would act as support to them, comma, either cutting off hawks or filling in for exhaustion. The rangers would be divided evenly on either side. Jay switched out the others who were still in the V formation, so they could learn the plan. After that, it was time to execute. Ready? Jay called out. Yep, yes. Yeah. Yep, sure, they all responded. All right, now. Jay ordered. There was a little confusion as they moved between each other. But in a matter of moments the new formation took shape. The adventurers seemed to have small, proud smiles as they moved themselves into a different formation in a matter of moments. But Jay seemed unimpressed. Hum, good enough. Jay thought, knowing his skeletons would have made them look like bumbling toddlers. Chapter 157. Just like that, their killing efficiency skyrocketed. More of the elementals could be culled now that they were facing a wall of six melee adventurers, turrets in the middle with rangers on either side. Anya was busy picking off nestlings, while using the occasional throwing knife on the stray stick ball. Jay was leisurely slashing and throwing the odd unstable tooth, causing a few nestlings to miss their targets completely. The extra help made the battle go much more smoothly, and without any people like the glaive guy, there were no issues. Unknown to Jay and his human troops, adventurers in the other fields were watching them, some with jealousy and others simply wanting to learn. They still fighting. Yikes. Oh, Jay's not really that strong. They all look so bored. They're not bored, they're focused. Adventurers gathered at the back of the field too, Paul having to hush them a few times. The once threatening wave of elementals was easy to deal with using the right formation, and their numbers plummeted. The last stick ball rolled towards the fearsome adventurers over many of the corpses of its own brethren. Shring. Finished with a single hit. Jay and his formation looked around for a moment, waiting to see if there were any more enemies. Not expecting the battle to be over so quietly. It was surprisingly easy. Hey, we did it the dagger girl said with a smile. Gralia. Dan yelled, holding his axe in the sky. Other adventurers simply caught their breath. Finally. I can go back to the dungeon, Jay thought, not saying it out loud, comma, he didn't want to discourage anyone who thought this was some huge accomplishment. Thanks for trusting my orders, Jay said as he went over to look at the remains of the nest spore. Some of the adventurers gave thankful smiles as he left them, a deep feeling of gratitude, comma, it was because of Jay that they not only got more X, but learnt some adventurer fundamentals. Never panic, always plan, check on your team, be decisive, and don't mind about looking weak. Anya followed along, seeing what Jay was looking at. Jay began to loot, leisurely casting his hand over the elementals. Not really expecting much, since no other adventurers were out there gathering loot. Thought so, nothing but X. He pursed his lips approaching the nest spore. Jay intended to learn from the slain creature comma similar to his skeletons. It was a sort of inanimate creation. It was also in Jay's nature to learn comma at least now that he was a necromancer anyway. Approaching the nest spore corpse, he crouched down and picked up some of the wood chunks. Hum. Can't learn anything from this. He glanced at the pile of hacked up wood. Kicking some of the wood, he went back to the entrance of the field. As he walked, he noticed the farmers in other fields had already started to gather the dead wood. Jay watched for a moment as they formed it into large pyramid-shaped piles, and then covered the outside with dirt. Hum, what are they doing? 
The farmers weren't the only ones after the wood elemental corpses. Similar to Jay, other adventurers were also checking over the treat hectopids' dead bodies, looking at their antlers and strange jointed wooden legs. Thankfully Paul was hanging around for a while, still looking after Peter and deciding if he should take him back to the association. Nice job mate, probably the best group here today. Paul nodded with a smile. Thanks, all in a day's work. Jay said casually, shrugging with a slight smile. Hey, here, I saved this for you before other adventurers could get to it. You deserve it. Paul pulled out a large pair of wooden antlers from his inventory. They're not worth much, but they look kinda cool. He said as he held them out. Oh cool, thanks. Jay had a look at them before stashing them in his inventory. The antlers were large and majestic, ending in threatening spikes. They were made from the incredibly dark brown wood like the rest of the treat. Jay guessed they would probably take up the whole wall in his butchery. But he was uncertain though, comma, perhaps the ceiling would be too low. Such were the majestic antlers of a treat hectopod, which could lift a person in the sky as they gutted them. Many adventurers were heading back to Losla now, and a few jealous adventurers glanced at Jay. After receiving the gift from the guard, comma, but they could say nothing. Jay and Anya had killed one of the treats by themselves, while their team worked together to kill the other two. The extra adventurers in Jay's field only came for the final wave of lesser elementals, so even they couldn't say anything either. As for the slain treats in other fields, adventurers began to squabble over who got the antlers, while others shook their heads, comma, had they learnt nothing. TCH who would want to party with someone who argues over such a large but cheap loot? Jay thought as he watched them fight. Many didn't realize that life was not about winning one prize, but it was a series of prizes, and how you conducted yourself with one, would determine if you were worthy to claim another. Sure, most of the wingiest childish adventurers would get some antlers today, comma, but, who would want to fight monsters with them after that? No one. They didn't realize that less people would want to fight with them, resulting in less dungeon opportunities, and hence, less prizes. Sadly, they were the last to realize, and by the time they did, it would be too late, comma, they would be far too underleveled to be of any use in a dungeon. The adventurers in the right field were the best example of this attitude. Stop grabbing it. Give it to me, it's mine. Another one just kept tugging at it senselessly. Since they were all pulling on the treat antlers, they were stopping anyone from even being able to cut them off. This was despite their guard being the one who killed all the treats. Thankfully, it was about to come to an end as their guard's expression grew more and more bitter. Soon enough, their guard let out a large sigh and walked towards them angrily. He was disgusted by their display, perhaps even ashamed. Back up, he ordered, his voice filled with killing intent and threatening. Like a pack of hyenas, they each stepped away from the corpse as a hungry lion approached. S-H-W-S-H-S-H-R-S-H-W shring. The guard's sword made flashes of light as it danced through the treed antlers. In a split second, the antlers were turned into wood chips before their eyes and their open mouths. W-H-Y. My antlers. You should have just given them to me. The guard did this to all the treat corpses in their field, and the adventurers looked as if they were babies that had their toys taken away. Some of their eyes turned red and watery, or full of bitter anger. Adventurers looking on were chuckling at them. Hair. Good. Classic. They should have learned to share. Everyone except those childish adventurers was smiling broadly. Despite no crime happening, it felt like justice had been carried out. Finally the fussy arguing was over. Even Jay shook his head with a smile seeking this, agreeing that they deserved it. Their actions brought a sense of shame to all the adventurers there, comma, whether they liked it or not, they were a reflection of all the adventurers in Losla. The best part was that they couldn't complain. They had zero claim on any of the monsters. Meanwhile, the farmers didn't seem to care. They were all working diligently to create more and more piles of wood and covering them in mud. Hum Jay looked more closely as he watched. Chapter 158. Say, what are the farmers doing? Jay asked Paul, pointing at the large teepee structures. And why are they covering them with dirt? Oh, that's how they make charcoal. Burning the wood with less air creates charcoal. I'm not really sure how it works though. Paul shrugged, finally deciding to just pick Peter up and carry him to the guild. Oh, okay. Thanks, thanks for today. You're welcome, mate. And again, nice work. You kept your mind clear and focused out there. Paul looked at some more adventurers fighting over the antlers. It's a shame more aren't like that. 
With a nod, Paul marched off chatting to the other guard as he carried Peter. Charcoal heard Jay scratched his chin, watching the whole process. I suppose it must be for forges or alchemy he guessed. Anya had been quietly following Jay the whole time, comma, they were meant to be running into the mist, keep dungeon today after all. You really did do well today. Anya encouraged, still standing around him. Thanks. Jay shrugged, he didn't feel like he was that impressive. Anyway, I was wondering, comma, are you planning to go back to Miss Keep today? She questioned. Yeah, of course, there's still plenty of time left in the day. Jay nodded, you coming? Anya smiled, yes please. Good, Jay nodded. And he went back to watching the charcoal burning process, comma, it was nearly over. Slowly, the adventurers in Jay's field, the ones who were under his command, had gathered up. They were talking and looking at Jay occasionally. Jay simply tried to ignore them, thinking they were like the gossiping adventurers that would wait outside of the dungeons, and murmur whenever he passed by. After they had a discussion, Dan left the group and approached Jay. Hey Jay, we were talking and decided that you should get the other set of antlers. Me, Jay said, raising a brow. He wanted an explanation. Well, we only slayed them because of you. Besides, you were literally drained by this one and did the most to slay it, so it's yours. Rightfully. Well sure then. Jay smiled. He wasn't going to turn down some extra loot. After grabbing them off Dan, Jay now had two sets of the large treant antlers. Treant antlers, comma, wooden elemental X2. Also, do you need any party members for a dungeon? Dan raised a brow, his eyes full of hope. Ah, not for now. Thanks, though, Jay let him down softly. I see well, I wouldn't know if I didn't ask. It's a shame you go solo all the time though, you're a good leader. Anyway, let me know if you change your mind. Dan nodded. Dan walked back to the group, smiling at them with a thumbs up. The rest of them smiled lightly, and they went back to discussing who should get the last pair of antlers. Anya was looking at Jay with a sly smile as she listened to the whole conversation. Seeing him turn down another adventurer almost made her laugh. What? I don't need anyone for now. I wasn't lying Jay smiled. Besides, it was weird that he noticed how I usually go alone. He shrugged, it's a little stalkerish. Anya shook her head, literally everyone notices that. What? This was the first Jay was hearing about it. He had no clue he was a topic of conversation among the young adventurers. On your side, not wanting to make too much of it. Basically no one but you goes into dungeons alone. Well, there is another guy doing it now too, but people notice stuff like that. Oh, huh. I guess it is a bit strange, comma, but I do go with you. Sometimes Jay shrugged with a smile. The piles of wood were now alight and soon to be charcoal. Simply from his curious nature, Jay decided to remember it. It wasn't every day one would see such an interesting process after all. With that, he began to walk through the farmland, back to Losler. There were still some rumbles and cracks of lightning sounding from somewhere south, but they were getting less and less common. The elemental incident was coming to a close, and all the adventurers were heading back to Losler. A few guards were left in the fields in case any more elementals came through but most of them now headed south to support any others who were still fighting. Jay and Anya walked in a scattered line of other adventurers heading back to Losla, getting the occasional glance, comma, but no one approached them. So on level 9 now Anya gave Jay a mischievous glance. You must be close to leveling up to 10 by now. Oh, yeah. Yep, very close. He chuckled, remembering to check his exp after the long battle. Jay quickly opened his notifications, trying to hide his grin as he opened it. 4625, exp, level up. 5 free attribute points. 1 free skill point. No one knows I'm now level 11 he thought, stifling a chuckle. Now, let's see I already decided to put 5 points into energy. So I can summon skeletons endlessly. Well, for a longer time anyway. Jay quickly dumped them into energy without a second thought. It was still clear in his mind how close he came to losing a battle with Estoba. If he ran out of mana slightly earlier, it may have been over. Jay and Anya walked back quietly. Most would think they were bored. However, Jay was considering where to put his ability point. Hum, I could have 5 level 4 skeletons. Or 4 level 5 skeletons 4 times 5 is still 20 either way. Hum, 
The skeletons are all still level 3 though. I shouldn't have waited to spend that other skill point. I think it'll be better to have an extra skeleton until they're all level 4. Otherwise it will just be a waste comma why raise their max level to 5 if they're not even 4 yet. With a nod, Jay added another point into his raise skill. Raise feeble creature level 4. Raise feeble creature level 5. Raise feeble creature level 5. Imbue a small skeleton with necrotic energy, raising it to fight for you. 4 slash 5 raised. Costs 5 mana plus 3 slash level of creature. Awesome. Still, he was trying not to smile all. While realizing he could now summon up to 5 skeletons. The new one would need time to level up. But every addition of a skeleton would make dungeons exponentially easier. Needless to say, he was now walking a little faster towards the miskeep dungeon. Perhaps if the new one killed high level creatures, it would level up faster. Unfortunately, he did not have access to their X pool. Information, J also got 100% of X when they killed something. So it seemed that they gained a different sort of hidden experience. As they walked through Losla, other adventurers began splitting off, comma, some went to other dungeons. Some went south to watch the battle, others went to the guild, but most went to lunch. The horn at the guild was no longer sounding, and the adventurers were no longer needed, comma, but still, the powerful battle in the south could still be heard, and it naturally drew adventurers towards it. Jay and Anya ignored everyone else as they proceeded with their plans. Heading straight into the Miskeep Dungeon. Chapter 159. Out of the hundred or so adventurers, only a handful of only the most dedicated were going to Miskeep to continue fighting. As they arrived, it seems that Dan, Conroy, the mace guy and the composite bow girl were there, having formed a party after today. Jay and Anya only nodded at them as they went in themselves. Stepping into the dungeon, they found themselves next to Astoba's throne. The pyramid was still opened up, split into two halves, and the dark inside seemed to almost welcome the dreary light from the sky, along with the warm adventurers. Okay? So, Jay was cut off. What did you do? Anya was shocked. We're at the third pyramid, right? She then talked to herself for a moment as she looked around. There's no way this is the fourth. No one is that quick. So it has to be the third. But it can't be you're not supposed to be able to enter back here. It's not meant to be conquered. Anya remembered the conversation she had last night in the guild mess hall with a guard. She remembered what the man said. You can't teleport to the third pyramid because you can't conquer it. She had planned to explain it to Jay with a hint of satisfaction, comma, but no. Instead she was the one who was shocked. Here they were comma teleported to the third pyramid, a ramp leading downwards in the ruined city, heading to the fourth pyramid. Are you done? We've got monsters to kill. Jay said, walking over to a pile of soul stones and Helvetian rings. Soul stones comma empty x15. Helvetian rings x2. Huh, wonder why the rings are so low. Jay raised a brow. Oh well, at least they're collecting them now. Next, Jay took out some bones from his gauntlet as he summoned his fifth skeleton. Slowly but surely, his undead army was getting larger and more powerful. Arise. He said, necrotic mana leaving the same hand his gauntlet was on. Strangely, the mana seemed to travel through the gauntlet's fingertips and exit through the claw tips, making it seem like Jay was a puppet master. Interesting he thought as the bones began to move. For a moment, the bones lifted and floated up before clinking down again. Nothing happened. Something wrong. Anya asked with a cheeky smile. It seemed she had recovered from the shock, and she simply accepted it was another crazy thing Jay had done. Just give me a sec. Jay gestured her off. Sure. Anya said as she went to look around in this massive open pyramid. Sadly, none of the walls had anything on them. After a small search, she simply gazed into the ruins towards the fourth pyramid. Jay began checking his skill, trying to find out why the skeleton wasn't summoning properly. Hum, what's the problem? Is it the raise feeble creature skill again? Jay tried again, and again the bones harmlessly clinked on the ground. Rereading the skill, he realized the problem, and felt a little silly comma he had this problem before, when he tried to raise a skeleton using a wolf corpse. Must be cast on a small corpse. It seemed that so far, only the street rat and soap rat corpses counted as small corpses. Well, thankfully I have a bunch of soap rat corpses. He smiled gladly. Jay took out some rat bones and a skull, repeating the raising process. This time, the summoning was a success. 
There we go he smiled. It's good not having to waste my time running around chasing after bullshit he thought. Glad he decided to stockpile some rat corpses. The new level 1 feeble creature stood there, gazing at its master. Huh, it's smaller than I remember. He thought as he gazed back into its hungry eyes. Just like the other skeletons, it was keenly ready to sink its claws into some flesh. Anya usually would watch the summoning, but at the moment she was looking at the weird throne, with all its strange instruments dotted around it. The young feeble creature looked at her, ready to slay her, as soon as it was given the order. It seemed like it was wondering why there was a human around that wasn't dead yet. Don't touch her. Jay squinted at it, sending a powerful thought. The creature immediately turned and looked at its master, waiting for orders. Jay had already summoned his other skeletons back to him as soon as he entered the dungeon. Like usual, he wasn't going to progress further without them around. Here we are. Jay smiled, seeing all four of them return. Why are their arms and hands black? Weird. Anya freaked out once more, seeing the mob of undead return. Wow, you got them armor. Freaking armor. I don't even have any armor. Even you don't have any and you gave them some. Well, that's a shame comma but not entirely true. Jay smiled mischievously and immediately donned his new armor. Necrotic Greaves X2. Necrotic Vambrance X1. Necrotic Barbute Helmet X1. No way, you have armor now too. That's so unfair. Anya shook her head. It is what it is. Jay shrugged as he noticed something on the skeletons. Oh, they have a few scratches on their armor good. I've been wanting to test this. Jay took out some bones from his gauntlet making a tidy little pile on the ground. Feast. He gestured to his skeletons and each of them began happily munching away. Anya's face grimaced a little as she watched this. It was simply too unnatural. Say Jay, have you seen this? She pointed at the throne with Estoba's corpse still lying on it. Seen what? This old guy. He had a note in his pocket. Huh. No. I mean, I used my loot skill on him but, I guess the note didn't count as loot. Jay raised a brow. What's it say? Here, she said, handing it to him. It seemed to be some sort of personal diary entries. Each of them began a little less legible as they went. Comma, I'm glad Heidi volunteered to be here. She really makes this compound a little less dark. Comma, I worry for Heidi, my assistant. Each passing day, I see the light fade from her eyes, replaced by desperation. Comma, Heidi always wanted children, and even after she turned part of her body to the cursed stone, it seems that she didn't give up. She has already created some different creatures using her own blood, comma, but she assures me that it's purely for experimentation. Comma, Heidi is changing herself, she says it's for the revenge pact. But I think the motives are obvious. Comma, her, comma, no. It. Its drive for offspring has only magnified as we have both aged. Perhaps a life-scaling chemicals are warping our minds. It gave up pieces of itself as time went by. Amputating itself, implanting different parts from other creatures, and conducting small-scale experiments on its own flesh. Comma, it released some specimens from containment and tried to leave in the chaos. I sealed the facility. We can only be opened from the outside now. Comma, even parts of its own soul were not spared from the mad experiments, and the more pieces of itself it ripped away, the madder it got. Comma, slowly it began adding parts of its experiments back into itself, eventually becoming the abominable beast that it is today. It's hard to tell if it's still alive, and I don't think Heidi is still with us. Comma, it released more specimens, then killed some soldiers. It's truly not human anymore. I have locked down the facility. No more experiments, comma, we have failed. Comma, I will sit here on my immortal throne, and will keep the pyramid locked down until the end of time, or until the stone guard saves me. If any of these creatures get free, our chance of revenge is lost. Perhaps everything will be lost, comma, not that we had much left anyway. Comma, the pact must live on. Long live Holvisha's revenge. Comma, it's making me mad, the constant scratching. Comma, chemicals, I love chemicals, feel good, good. Jay took a big breath in after reading this. Fuck, so that's what it was also why it was mad enough to give half its soul up. He thought. Pretty damn tragic I suppose even emptiness can turn some people into monsters. While they don't start out that way, it doesn't mean they're not currently monsters. Pity is not reserved for monsters. He shrugged, scrunching up the note and tossing it away. 
Anya looked at him as if expecting some emotional response, comma, he was the one who dealt with the creature anyway. Oh, thanks by the way. That was enlightening. Jay nodded and turned back to his new level 1 feeble creature. Anya shook her head as Jay prepared his little minion. Hum, I'll have to make you some armor at some point. I guess it'd be a waste to make it now. While you're so little though. He looked at the small skeleton. It was barely up to his waist. Hun, you're probably too small to wield a hammer too. I guess a bone dagger would be better than nothing though. Jay nodded before calling to Anya. Just give me a couple minutes, sorry, he said. Anya didn't seem to mind, she was still looking around the immortal throne, as he pulled out some bones and sat down, preparing to make a dagger for his new minion. Hum now that I have level 3 Scrinshaw, I wonder if the dagger will be different. Chapter 160 Jay sat cross-legged as a new instrument floated down before him. A fresh bone dagger with a dark grey streak through it floated down before him as he received a notification. Success, comma, recipe, upgraded. Oh, Jay smiled. Well then, let's see the new dagger. Bone dagger level 3. 5 damage, comma, slashing, comma, piercing. 1 stamina damage, comma, drain. Plus 50% damage from backstab attacks. Lifespan, comma, requires essence to maintain its form. Current lifespan, 20 hours. Stamina drain. Cool might be more useful against living enemies, but still useful. I'll take it, he nodded. Jay crafted a few more to see if any stats were different, but they were all the same. So he simply stashed them in his inventory. They would turn back to raw bone after 20 hours, and then he would just add them back to his gauntlet. Alright, here's your weapon. Jay handed it to his skeleton, give it to Blue. When its lifespan gets low, the skeleton grabbed the dagger looked closely at the weapon, and then gripped it firmly. It seemed quite content with its new tool. Off you go, Jay pointed at the other four skeletons waiting by the side. He smiled seeing it slink over to join the formation, and immediately incorporate into the group of skeletons, comma, compared to the adventurers outside the dungeon. The skeletons made teamwork seem way too simple. It was like it had been fighting with them all along. I definitely prefer the undead, Jay slowly nodded, scratching his chin. With the skeletons ready there was nothing left to do now except to move on. Ready to go. He turned to Anya. She was still fiddling around with the broken immortal throne. Oh, comma, yep. So we're going to the fourth pyramid today. Since you conquered this one Anya asked as she walked over to the group. You guessed it. Jay nodded as he took out his hammer. Awesome. Hopefully it will be better than the third. N-N. Hopefully. He nodded. It seemed that whatever passive fear effect was no longer plaguing Anya's mind, she was normal again and back to her usual self. They both began walking down the ramp out the back of the pyramid, and Jay thought he should probably warn Anya about what happened. So, I should probably tell you, comma, you know that level 133 centipede thing. Well, you see, I accidentally let a whole bunch of them loose. Jay chuckled, scratching his head. You didn't. Anya gasped. How are we going to deal with them? Well, I did but don't worry, they're around a level, and the skeletons can easily deal with them, so we should be fine. Jay shrugged with a cheeky grin. Anya could only sigh and shake her head as they descended into the city ruins once more. As they walked closer to the pyramid, it seemed that the weather began to change. The overcast clouds above were getting harder to see as a thick mist rolled in out of nowhere. A heavy fog is moving in. I can't see anything, Anya said, sounding a little worried. Don't worry, the skeletons can see through the fog. Just try not to accidentally hit them. No promises. She shrugged, returning Jay's cheeky grin back to him. Distant cries, shrieks and echoes of pain filled the dungeon as they walked through the thick fog, coming from some other places in the ruined city. It was a cursed land that had somehow become more dangerous now. It was tense now, as the dehexapods were roaming around, comma, quite different to the predictable behavior of the stone soldiers. It was hard to tell how many dehexapods were released, but they both felt like they were walking around in a nest of them, comma, some cries were even coming from behind them now. There was a chance they were somehow breeding or leveling themselves up by slaying the Helvetian soldiers fighting each other over the soul stones. Perhaps they were even eating each other. Jay was only concerned about one thing. Were they lone hunters or did they work together in hunters packs? If the latter was true, things could get difficult. It would be troublesome to deal with many of them rather than one powerful one. He still had to protect Anya too, 
and in this fog, it was even getting hard to see her as she walked only a few meters alongside the party. Sometimes Jay would still remember the tense feeling when Sullivan ordered him to protect her. It wasn't explicitly a death threat, but it sure felt like one. Anya, stay close, within reaching distance. Jay said as he pulled out the Deathwalker's sentry. Sure. The Deathwalker's sentry was a useful addition, it was another pair of eyes that would be handy, comma, especially one that could see through fog. Scry. Distant cries continued to sound out, coming from somewhere deep in the fog. Soon enough, they came across some crumbled stone soldiers. Their bodies were decimated and completely broken down into small chunks. Was this slain by the skeletons? Anya asked. No, I don't think so. They wouldn't waste time breaking them down like this. Jay crouched down as he looked at more of the stone bodies hidden in the fog, and he soon found some dark slime-like substance on part of a stone gauntlet. Four of the fingers were chewed off already. Hum, seems like they're not only eating soul stones. This could get troublesome. Jay squinted into the fog as he stood up, waving his shield around in case this was a trap. Thankfully, the shield gave no response. What's wrong with that? Anya whispered. The normal ones eat soul stones to get stronger. But there was another type which could eat body parts to get stronger he whispered back. Anya suddenly became more vigilant and didn't say anything, only gripping her crossbow a little more tightly. As she stared into the fog and listened to more of the shrieking sounds, she immediately realized the implications of this. We should hurry and finish this dungeon before they get too strong, Jay suggested. Anya nodded and Jay commanded the skeletons to march a little faster. They made some extra noise now. But it would be worth getting to the fourth pyramid faster. It seemed like only a matter of time before this part of the dungeon would be off limits. Chapter 161 Jay and Anya continued to sneak through the mist behind the skeletons, while the dehexapods continued to shriek and call out through the dungeon. After walking for some time, a tall black tower slowly emerged from the heavy fog. It was made from heavy blocks of the same dark stone as the rest of the dungeon. The entrance had no door, and was extended outwards from the structure like a tunnel. After sending in a skeleton to make sure it wasn't a trap, Jay quickly stuck his head in to take a look around Comma on the inside. It was just an empty room. There were no windows or stairs going to the top of the tower. There wasn't even a gate. Weird. I didn't see any other structures before we started walking. It's like this tower just appeared somehow. Jay whispered. Me either. Anya shrugged. After looking around and finding nothing of use, the two left again. Jay couldn't help but wonder why the strange tower had appeared in the mist though. He could only guess that it raised from the ground and was simply another weird part of the dungeon. They continued in roughly the direction of the pyramid, leaving the empty tower in the mist behind them. Suddenly, Jay stopped in his tracks and looked around, while having the skeletons form a circle around them. Hum. Anya gave him a questioning glance. Do you hear that? He whispered. Hear what? Exactly they're all quiet. The only sound was a gentle breeze traveling through the ruins, as the calling to hexapods were now silent comma but not for long. Sounds of multiple shrieks bellowed out. A crescendo of wailing voices sounded out all around Jay and Anya. Fuck, we're surrounded looks like the pack hunters Jay said, raising his shield. Scree. The first dehexapod appeared from the mist with a slicing attack against one of the skeletons, comma the skeleton. Saw it coming at the last moment, and was ready, bracing itself before taking a hit. The two skeletons near it all got to work, smashing their hammers against the creature. The dehexapod was much shorter than the level 133 they initially came across, and its speed was similarly slower, about the same speed as one of the skeletons, though this was still incredibly fast by human standards. With no time to rest, another dehexapod appeared from the other side of the defensive circle. Anya already began to launch bolts at them, causing them to stagger for a moment, and allowing the skeletons to get some easy hits in. Meanwhile, Jay hadn't acted yet. He looked conflicted as he was still listening to the screeching sounds. Despite there being numerous voices, they were only being attacked by two. Perhaps these two dehexapods were merely the tip of the iceberg. Suddenly, the dehexapods both looked at each other and scurried off, climbing back into the ruins and hid in the mist. That was weird Anya said, maybe they were scared of each other. Anya's attitude was pretty casual compared to Jay. Jay was not responding as his thoughts were racing about what to do. He thought about the possible defensive formations they could take against multiple dehexapods. 
but it seemed that fighting as many as three of them would become a life and death battle. One thing was clear to Jay. They were in imminent danger. Those two were just to test us. Jay whispered, we might have to leave the dungeon. Anya now looked conflicted too comma she definitely didn't want to leave and fighting with Jay was a rare opportunity only afforded to her. The attack hadn't begun and perhaps it was a good thing that Jay didn't attack. The dehexapods wouldn't know his power and would possibly hold off attacking. Even for a moment it would be an advantage. Jay was stressing slightly, clenching his jaw while trying to think up any possible formation comma but he realized that wasn't the answer. This was when he remembered the Silkwoods dungeon. Against an overwhelming force of ethereal spiders, he used a choke point. We have to get back to the tower. He was still whispering, but a little more loudly. Oh, okay. Anya was surprised at how tense Jay seemed. He was usually much more relaxed. Scree. The attack signal sounded as they started moving back to the tower. It seemed that the dehexapods noticed their change of direction and responded immediately. Run, Jay yelled. He had three skeletons protect them from behind while two ran at either side. Scree. One was really close, screeching from somewhere behind them, but no one looked back. Your feeble creature has been slain. The small skeleton was grabbed and executed immediately, though Jay ignored the notification. He was just glad that the new skeleton served a purpose, even if it was to slow down a group of dehexapods, if only for a moment. Jay's shield squeezed his arm right before another dehexapod appeared from the mist in front of them. Clun. Minus 3.3. He raised it just in time, blocking a slash from its claw, while he had the two skeletons on either side jump on it, and keep it busy. They couldn't afford to slow down. Uncaring rip. Jay stashed his shield and reached out with his gauntlet comma the creature, shuddered for a moment while its collarbone was ripped out causing it immense pain. Shree. Despite the tense situation, a sly grin appeared on Jay's face, though only for a moment. Jay and Anya slipped past it as it was beaten by the skeleton's hammers. Jay made them throw caution to the wind and take damage so they could deal as much as possible. The dehexapod clearly didn't expect such resistant yet careless enemies, as it let Jay and Anya dash by. Only two skeletons were left guarding them now, bringing up the rear of the party. Jay and Anya kept running only hoping they were going in the right direction, comma, the tower was still nowhere in sight, while it was hard to tell if they were even going the right way. Damn, how many skeletons will I have to sacrifice? Jay wondered. Losing skeletons wasn't so bad, but each of them carried the bone hammers, which took blocks of metal to craft. Jay had no more metal chunks or hammers in his inventory, so equipping the skeletons after resummoning was not possible, comma, they would have to find the hammers again. With enough distance, Jay had the skeletons disengage from the dehexapod, but one didn't make it. Your skeleton has been slain. The lone skeleton caught up to them quickly, comma, however, another dehexapod soon emerged from the fog too, and hence another skeleton had to be sacrificed. It might as well be the weak one, Jay thought, commanding it to jump at the new enemy. A few shrieks later and the third skeleton died. Your skeleton has been slain. It did the trick buying them some time. As they ran, it sounded like a stampede was coming for them, but thankfully the tower emerged from the mist once more. It was like a breath of fresh air, and each of them felt a rise of hope in their hearts. There, Anya yelled. The two dashed in quickly, followed by the two remaining skeletons. Get ready, Jay said as he stood in the entrance. A dehexapod came charging in straight after them, comma, only to be met with the blunt strikes of the hammers. Bits of its body chipped off and cracked as it cried in pain. Immediately it regretted its foolish charge, yet it couldn't stop. The sheer speed of it managed to push back the skeletons and get close to Jay. But he braced himself and got his shield out, letting it take all the damage. Smashing it with his shield, and it was brought to a halt. Jay smiled as it came to a stop. He was glad these dehexapods were smaller, remembering how the assistant sent him flying. Shring. 14.4 Immediately he retaliated, slashing his sword across its decaying human face. The two skeletons got to work now, hitting its sides while Jay slashed in its face, it was forced to back up. The dehexapod was in a horrible position, each hit of the skeletons against its legs, and the twisted black spines across its back, causing it to shudder in pain and slow its movement. Meanwhile the sword attacks on its face were stopping it from accurately slashing its talons at anything. Jay smiled slyly. Its retreat was pathetic, 
And this was all he needed. Time. A pile of bones suddenly appeared near him, and was suddenly covered with the dark green necrotic mana. Bones began floating in the cloud of mana. And one by one, skeletons marched out with a glint of revenge in their eyes. The last one summoned was the level 1 feeble creature. The higher level skeletons were summoned with their armor on. It became a part of them. Dot though, after dying it was cracked all over with chunks missing. Seeing their poor armor, Jay decided to remain defending with the other skeletons. While letting them eat their fill of the bone pile. The two skeletons were holding it off. But without Jay there, they were taking a few hits too. Before entering the fight again, Jay took a moment to analyze it. Dehexapid Soul Eater, comma level 3. HP 103. Slash 103. Damage. 6 slashing, comma upper body appendages. 4 slashing, comma legs. Skills. Congenital linking, comma 31 slash 58. Shares its strength with other creatures. Amalgamation, comma body parts. Consumes to grow stronger. Has become immortal. Dire Blades. The Dehexapid slashes its target with its Saber Talons. 4 damage per successful leg slash. Brittle Armor. 40% damage reduction to slashing. Stabbing damage. 20% more damage taken from crushing damage. Holvisha's Revenge. Magic damage immune. Any wielded weapons become cursed. Description. A soldier of hunger. Pain. Empty. Hunger. Pain. Empty. Hunger. Pain. Empty. Hunger. Pain. Empty. Oh, it's only level 3. I guess it's strong because of the soul linking dam. So there's 31 of them. I wonder what happened to the other 27. J rolled his tongue in his cheek. I wonder if there are bigger packs than this. Chapter 162. The treat slashed at the skeletons as J jumped closer. None of its abilities took J by surprise. So he fearlessly went in and began slashing again, supporting the skeletons and blocking a few hits. Klong dot shring. He blocked a swipe with Deathwalker's sentry and retaliated with a slash. Fwoosh. A heavy bolt flew past and pierced the creature right in the center of its chest. Scree. Seizing the opportunity, one of the skeletons suddenly dropped its hammer and pierced its claw-covered hand right into the dehexapod's abdomen. Oh, Jay could only guess what was happening as he looked on. It seemed that the creature was in immense pain, as the skeleton's hand carved up its insides, searching for one of its hearts. The pale sunken eyes of the creature began to roll back into its skull. As the skeleton found its target, a lump of black flesh was ripped out, and the creature fell to the ground. 65 x the skeleton dropped the heart of the creature on the ground, while the other one searched it, bringing back three soul stones for Jay. Oh, maybe they don't drop Holvetian rings. That must be why there's so many soul stones to collect. Jay thought as he added them all to his inventory. Soul stone comma empty, x3. There was only a short breather from the fight, as more dehexapods were outside, trying to claw their way in as they fought over who got to enter the tower next. Jay and Anya could hear them crawling all over the walls and the roof, their bug-like stone legs tapping and thudding against the outside. Thankfully, the tower stood strong. It seems that it was another invincible part of the dungeon's core structure. Scree. Another dehexapod charged in, carelessly trampling over its fallen brother, and piercing its corpse to no end. Ugh, how many are there? Anya reloaded another bolt, the rails of her weapon still glowing slightly from the last one. Just keep shooting them. Jay ordered as he stood between the skeletons once more. The duo continued to fight, stopping any dehexapods from getting further in comma they have no other option. The tower was both like a trap and a perfect defense, and they would hold their ground. A few more shrieks and scratches later, and the second one was dead. 65 x Soul Stone Comma Empty X2 Jay blocked many times during the fighting, and Deathwalker's sentry lost its green necrotic glow as its energy dwindled. Though it wasn't much of a problem now that Jay had put more points into his energy, easily recharging it. The freshly summoned skeletons had finally recovered their armor and rejoined the fighting. They didn't have any of their hammers, so Jay just gave them the daggers he crafted in the third pyramid. They weren't very effective against the petrified bones of the creature's exoskeleton or its thick leathery flesh, but it was better than nothing. The level 1 feeble creature was by Jay's side all this time. It seemed to want to attack, but so far, it found no openings. Jay really couldn't blame it though. The Dehexapods were a much higher level, and it was much slower and smaller than the other skeletons. 
Another dehexapod ventured into the tower entrance, though it had a tougher time trying to get in because of the other two corpses. After taking a few hits from the skeletons and having hardly any room to move around in, it retreated. Huh, I guess they're not completely stupid. Jay shrugged. The attack was finally over. Phew, that was a little intense. On your side. Yeah, good thing this tower was here. So what now? Hum, I'll send out some skeletons to see if there's any enemies left in the area. Then we can move to the fourth pyramid. Jay said as two skeletons immediately ran out of the tower and into the mist. Okay, sounds good. I still have my skill if we need it. Good Jay nodded, just save it for an emergency. Anya nodded as she watched two of the skeletons leave. Her eyes then drifted to a different skeleton. It was acting strangely. Hey, that one is being weird. Anya pointed. Hum. Jay watched the skeleton for a moment. It was periodically looking at the bone pile. Jay analyzed it, and a grin began to form on his face. You already leveled up. He smiled. Germinating skeleton level 4, blue. Type comma undead. Roll comma unclear. HP comma 75 slash 75 comma plus 20 comma equipment. MP comma 10 slash 10. Armor comma 29. Skills. Bone eater. Scrimshaw level 1 comma passive. Undeath comma passive. Fear comma weak comma passive. Shade vision comma passive. Description. An abomination, its existence spits in the face of life, and death comma and they spit back. Stop it before it's too late. Execute with extreme prejudice. Burn the bones. This was followed by another notification which lit a fire in Jay's heart. Please choose a role from available categories, comma, available categories are based on the skeleton's qualitative experience. If no choice is made, a random role will be assigned once the skeleton levels up. Commander. Warrior. Guard. Fuck yeah, they have roles. He looked at Blue with a smile. Guard and warrior makes sense. And I'm guessing you got the commander because I put you in charge of the other skeletons. Obviously we're going to go with the commander role. Jay grinned. Choice. Commander. Oh, so it's only a choice for now. Write the level up part. I guess we will have to wait till you hit level 5. Jay shook his head with a smile. Hum, I bet if I gave you all shields or bows, we could find some other roles. Blue kept looking at the bone pile, and Jay nodded while mentally giving it the green light to eat as much as it wanted. Jay suddenly had an idea, comma, he immediately got another dagger, and turned to his new level 1 feeble creature. Here, he forced it to dual wield daggers. It might be too late for the others. It might not be. But you're definitely going to become something cool. He smiled. I wonder what else I can do. Maybe if I abuse and beat up a skeleton regularly, it will get some sort of masochist class. He scratched his chin as he looked at his skeletons. Nah, I can't do that to them. I like them too much. He pursed his lips and watched the level 1 feeble creature. The creature seemed content with whatever weapon it was given. It went back to the formation as it twisted its wrists, and got into a fighting stance with its dual daggers. The stance it made was quite strange, comma, one dagger was held low, and one was held high. Jay thought he would have probably done the same stance if that were him. He wasn't sure if the skeleton somehow tapped into his subconscious thoughts to find a battle stance, or if it was simply the most obvious stance, comma, at least from Jay's perspective. Blue was finished eating now, comma, it didn't get much taller. But its bones seemed to get thicker, and its chest became wider. As Jay looked at Blue's upgraded body, he guessed that this might be what Michael's skeleton may look like, comma, being the guard captain had given him a sturdy, muscular physique, so surely his bones were larger too. Hum. Even then, Blue would still probably have a thicker skeleton, he said as he scratched his chin. Anya only watched on silently as Jay chatted to his skeletons. It was like he forgot she was here, off in his own little world with his own little friends. Despite the little friends being fearsome skeletons, it actually seemed quite wholesome. Clink clink tap clink. Two skeletons returned from the mist, as healthy and whole as when they left, comma, the coast was clear. The dehexapids had truly left. Alright, it seems like we're safe to move on. We should probably jog to the pyramid, since the dehexapids knew where we were even while we were being quiet and sneaking. Are you ready? Jay suggested as he added the remaining pile of bones back into his gauntlet. Sure, back into the mist we go. 
Miss Keat Dungeon it's a suitable name. Jay said as they left the tower, entering the thick fog once more. Neither of them could see the skeletons in front of them, comma, but Jay could sense them. So he had no worries. Anya simply had to trust and follow Jay. As they jogged, they soon came across the remains of the other skeletons. Their bodies were slashed apart and broken into many smaller fragments. Some were even covered with black slime. It seems that some of the dehexapods had a little snack. Jay said as he picked up and studied a bone. One by one, the skeletons reclaimed their hammers, while Jay reclaimed their bones. Screeches and shrieks began sounding in the dungeon once more. The dehexapods were on the move again. Damn it, just how far away are we? Jay wondered as they kept running through the fog. Should we go back? It doesn't feel right Anya still whispered. No, let's just run faster. Remember, it's a level 3 dungeon. It shouldn't be that hard. They pushed on, and once more the dungeon became eerily quiet again. Keep running, at the very least we can see how far we get. Use your skill if things get bad, and we'll just leave the dungeon. Okay, Anya nodded simply trying to stick to Jay's side as they ran. It would be a failure if they were separated in the mist. Suddenly, another tower emerged from the mist. There it is, wait, it's another tower. Anya said. Hum yeah, we should have been at the next pyramid by now. Scree. With the advancing dehexapods, they had no choice but to take refuge in the tower once more. As they approached, Jay slowed down his run as he looked at it, comma, completely identical to the previous tower except without the two dead dehexapod corpses inside. Get inside and get ready. It seems like we're gonna be tower hopping for quite some time. Jay gestured to the entrance. Jay followed behind Anya as they quickly went into the shelter of the tower, comma, just in time too, as the first dehexapod showed up. The five skeletons had already blockaded the entrance. Each of them were determined to get revenge on these creatures for ending their lives previously. Immediately they all dashed forward to counter the dehexapod's charge. Their hammers crunched into the dehexapod's body and chipped away their blackstone body parts. The dehexapod didn't know what hit it as it suddenly lost a large chunk of health. Wasn't it supposed to be the one confounding its enemies? Clearly it had become overconfident from its congenital buff. The foolish creature needed to learn its place as a level 3 monster. Nicely done Jay nodded approvingly. He was waiting at the back, his arms folded as he watched, nodding in approval whenever a skeleton dodged or got a decent swing in. The small feeble creature had managed to get a few hits in too, so hopefully it would level up soon. In not time at all, two of the skeletons were already digging around in the dehexapod's body with their hands, making it cry in pain while dying miserably. Without so much as a claw attack landing on the undead, it was quickly culled, finished off by a final bolt to the chest. 65, X, Soul Stone, comma, Empty, X1. Hum, I guess they have become reliant on fighting in the mist. They're hopeless otherwise. Jay thought while a skeleton brought a soul stone to him. During the fight, Blue proved to be an imposing force on the battlefield. The level 3 skeletons could merely chip and chunk away at the creature's carapace, while the level 4 skeleton could basically shatter parts of it, ripping its hammer out and creating a larger hole. As for the parts of the creature's leathery flesh, it was simply ruptured, teared, and broken away. Next level I think I might give it a shield Jay thought as he looked at it. It was dual wielding the hammer effectively now. Each of its swings were much faster and much more powerful. It was clear that it could definitely use it one-handed if Jay so desired. Without more time to analyze, the next dehexapod entered with a shriek, comma, another was behind it as well. The one behind it seemed to want revenge. It couldn't get past either. So it simply pushed its ally into the wall of skeletal death. So dumb. Jay shook his head disappointed in the foolish tactics of the creatures. They truly are just mindless beasts I guess. He shrugged. A little disappointed in the poor tactics of his enemies. Jay let Blue command the other skeletons. It seemed that it was better at commanding the other skeletons now too. As at different points in the fight, some skeletons would move back while others would simultaneously go into attack. The dehexapod would slash at skeletons which were retreating comma and miss, while being pounded on from a different side. Turning to the other side, the process would repeat itself. The low-level dehexapods were a useful training tool for the skeletons. It wasn't as cunning as a higher-level enemy. 
but had a larger health pool. Right now, it was their punching bag. Jay couldn't actually imagine a better scenario than this to train his minions. A part of him almost wanted to mock the level 3 dungeon comma, but he decided not to tempt its wrath. Have the new skeleton attack more Jay ordered through his mind. Blue didn't turn back to Jay, but it turned its bone skull towards the level 1 feeble creature with its dual wield daggers. Jay didn't need a clue or a yes sir. It was obvious that it was already carrying out Jay's will. The little skeleton dashed into the fray, eagerly plunging its dual daggers into the tough, leathery, skin-like joints of the dehexapod. Chapter 163 The dehexapod looked uncomfortable as the small skeleton was running around under it causing mayhem. Each of its legs shuddered when a dagger was pierced into their joints. The monster couldn't even defend itself now, much less attack. Hammers smashed down on it repeatedly, and just as it got used to the pace of the battle, a bolt would suddenly pierce into its chest. There was nothing it could do. It was outmatched. It was a completely different fight. Compared to when it was part of a sworn comma, it had never even been attacked until now. A primal fear set in a stressful panic. It desired to flee, but at this point it didn't have a choice. But to fight comma its own kin was behind it, pushing it forward and blocking its retreat. After a desperate struggle, the light from its eyes left it while its body collapsed. The next dehexapod walked over its corpse, and soon enough, it met the same fate. 130 x Soul Stone, comma, empty x6. A third charged in, but it died even faster than the second. Jay's party was getting proficient at slaying them, especially with the crafty little dual dagger skeleton, contributing to the fight now too. 65 x Soul Stone, comma, empty, X2. Screeching noises came from the mist as the third one died, and the attack was over. All the dehexapods crawling over the tower disappeared, and the dungeon went completely quiet again. Okay, looks like it's over. Let's move. Jay pointed to the mist. They had to climb over the piled up corpses to get back outside, but then they were well on their way. Hum three dehexapods Jay thought as they ran through the cloud, beginning to notice a pattern. Once more, a crescendo of screeching sounds pierced the silence comma right as another tower appeared in the mist. Once again they repeated the same strategy. Enter the tower, form a wall of skeletons, exterminate the hopeless creatures. After a short battle later in the new tower, three more dehexapods had died. 195 exp. Soul Stone, comma, empty, X7. Just like last time the dungeon went quiet after three were slain. Okay, I think that pretty much confirms it. They retreat after three die. Jay nodded silently to himself. You alright there? Anya asked, seeing him nod. He looked like he knew something. Yeah, I just have a hunch. Ready to leave. Jay decided not to share in case he was wrong. Yet she smiled, they're getting easier to kill. I guess that congenital linking skill makes them weaker as they die. Oh yeah, I forgot about that comma hair. I just thought we were getting more efficient. Jay chuckled with a shrug. Anya smiled back as she ripped a bolt out of a dehexapod. Probably a mix of both. She added, alright, let's see if we can make it into the next tower before the next attack. Just try to keep up Anya curled her lips. Jay stashed his weapon and shield away as they both ran through the fog. Scree. Damn, so soon. Anya frowned. No, I think the next tower must just be further away. Let's just keep running. Jay urged her as he made three skeletons cover them from behind again. Without much more warning, the level one creature was the first to be snatched. Your feeble creature has been slain. Damn it, where the hell is the next tower? Jay thought, clenching his jaw. Compared to the distance between the last two towers, they had run about twice as far with no tower in sight. Did we run past it? Or could it be just a little further? What if we were meant to stay at the third tower? Thoughts were running through Jay's head as the dehexapod swarm bore down on them, charging mercilessly. Your skeleton has been slain. Ham, it surely isn't that simple. Jay thought. As the second one died, Jay put his idea into action. Anya, we're gonna stop running and fight them. What? But we don't even know how many there are. We'll be fine. I think I figured something out. Jay gave a reassuring smile as he had the three skeletons behind them turn around to face the brunt of the swarm. Multiple dehexapods clashed against the skeletons, causing them to jump back multiple times. Thankfully the dehexapods slowed down after some painful hammer strikes. The skeletons did take a few hits, 
but it was worth it to stop the swarm. Anya had already started launching bolts which slowed them down enough for the skeletons to defend themselves. Jay had already created a large bone pile on the ground and started summoning skeletons. Just focus on one of them at a time Jay said as he went to join the fight with his undead minions. Focus one. But there's so many Anya thought to herself as she shook her head. Looking at Jay fighting, she was curious why he seemed so calm. He was blocking slashes and dealing damage with the skeletons. Not really standing out very much though, he wasn't some incredible fighter. Yet he seemed fine as he had a relaxed look. Your skeleton has been slain x1 x1. x1. Jay resummoned them as quickly as he lost them. The fight was mostly one-sided, but the dehexapods were slowly being chipped away at. The dehexapod suddenly shuddered as a bone was ripped right out of its body. Black blood and unknown tissue went everywhere, splashing onto other dehexapod faces, as the bone flew into Jay's gauntlet being crushed and disappearing. The wailing dehexapod then went down with a final hit from one of the skeletons. 65, X. The first dehexapod finally went down, along with another skeleton perishing which was quickly resummoned. The semicircle of dehexapods surrounding them all paused for a moment as they were weakened. Chapter 164. The semicircle of dehexapods surrounding them all paused for a moment as they were weakened. Boom exclamation point dot tat tat tat. You shouldn't rest in battle. Jay smiled after sending an explosive tooth. The explosion rang out and for a moment as the mist dispersed around it, temporarily making it easier to see. A gaping crater was formed in another dehexapod's flesh. And unfortunately for the poor creature, a bone arm was soon sticking into the deep wound tearing up its insides. 65, X. The other dehexapods seemed to slow down a little after the second one died. It was like they had lost their vigor, comma, though. Both Jay and Anya knew it was because the less of them there were, the weaker they became. While not possessing much intelligence, the creatures slowly made their way around the front line and began attacking at the sides. Despite being level 3, there were still about 20 of them, and they still had the numbers to overrun their enemies. Ah, Jay. Anya looked a little worried. I know Jay leisurely nodded as he sent some more exploding teeth into each side. Your skeleton has been slain. Your feeble creature has been slain. Damn it bad time to die guys. Jay thought as he watched them crumble. He brought them back as quickly as they went down. Glad he invested in his mana pool. Only one more he thought as he went back to fighting. Shring. Boom. A sword slash was followed by a quick tooth spell. Bringing another dehexapod down to the ground as a skeleton hand pierced into its body. It could only screech with its last breath as its insides were pulled out. 65, X. J. Help. Anya yelled as two dehexapods had made it to her, about to slash her to pieces. J only looked back at her with a smile, comma, the third dehexapod has just died as she yelled out. Ha! Huh. Anya was about to use her prostrate ability, but then the enemies froze in front of her, comma, no attack came. Along with them, the dehexapods suddenly all froze and screeched before returning back to the mist and hiding once more. Anya was still looking confused as Jay was still looking at her with a cheeky grin. Care to explain? Anya said while rubbing a finger between her eyebrows. Well, you only need to kill three of them and they retreat. Killing two seems to weaken them, then a third makes them give up. Jay raised his chin with a slight smile. Oh, so you figured it out. I guess I was too focused on the battle to realize. Anya said as she reloaded her crossbow. Hey, yeah. Anyway, let's keep moving Jay said as he added the bone pile back to his ring, along with any fallen skeletons. Slowly but surely, Jay was changing. He was beginning to see the broader picture of battles, rather than the one versus one fights. With his skeletons fighting for him, he could practice tactics and strategy while being able to analyze the battle freely with a calm mind. It was a simple skill to have, but for a normal adventurer, it would take years to get a feel for it. Many wouldn't even learn such a skill unless they found themselves in a leadership position, instead just following orders and focusing on their fighting skills. Let's keep moving. Hopefully the next tower isn't too far Jay pointed into the mist. Once again, the party began running through the mist. Do you hear that? Jay pointed up as they stopped running and listened for a moment. Instead of the odd background screech in the distance, there were new sounds comma hearing thudding, crunching and clashing sounds. Yeah, Anya narrowed her eyes, gazing into the mist. 
It's coming from up ahead. MMN, let's stop running. Jay began walking again as Anya followed. They didn't want to run right into the middle of an intense battle in the thick mist. They could both hear some battle sounds mixed in with a sea of screeching. After fighting the dehexapods all this time, they could now recognize the difference between their normal screeches and the ones they did when they were in pain, comma, and these were definitely the latter. As they got closer to the battle, the thick mist began to clear, and they could see the majestic fourth pyramid standing in all its glory, silently standing under the overcast sky. The mist behind them formed a wall, it was like a barrier was holding it back. Jay and his party stood at the very edge of the mist, comma, ready to retreat back into it at the sign of trouble. As they looked around they found where all the noisy racket was coming from. In front of the pyramid piles of corpses were littered around, stacking up and forming a small mound of flesh in front of a line of spearmen statues. Each of their shields had a few scratches on them, but it was nothing compared to the damage they dealt to the dehexapods. Each of their dehexapods lives were snuffed out proficiently, while their bodies collapsed pathetically in an ever-growing pool of black blood and organs. The line of spearmen formed a phalanx which stood at the top of a small ramp. They were aligned between two pillars which connected to the pyramid with large walls, comma, the only way into the pyramid would be through them. In the pyramid behind them, strangely, was a small human-sized entrance. None of the statues could possibly hope to fit through it. The most intriguing part was the units backing up the spearmen statues. Behind a phalanx of spearmen were some floating statues. Each of them had no lower torso or weapon, comma, instead, they had some large gauntlets which ended in long claws. Huh, just like the giants at the third pyramid. Jay thought as he recalled the huge statues at the entrance to the third pyramid. It seemed that these weren't just for show, comma, each of them were launching spells from their gauntlets. But how are they using magic, aren't they magic immune? Jay raised a brow as he gazed at them. Each of their gauntlets were periodically charging a purple spindle-shaped spell which was sent off into the swarm of dehexapods. The spell seemed to have no effect though, as the dehexapods were similarly immune to non-physical magic. Jay thought it was quite foolish of them to keep casting ineffective spells, but he guessed that the statues were simply too old, relying on their instincts as they kept launching endless, useless spells. Their minds had left them. Chapter 165 Jay had a regretful, pitying smile. But he was soon bothered by something, comma, he wouldn't know how strong this spell is, or what it did, until he actually experienced it. This was the least of their problems for now though, as there was another dilemma facing them. Do they wait to see if the dehexapods can thin out the stone guards before entering the battle, comma, or do they enter now? Before all the dehexapods die out, taking some pressure off themselves while fighting the stalus. It was clearly a different pack of dehexapods too as the one they fought in the mist only had about 15 left, the number of them fighting this battle were in the mid-40s. Jay squinted at them for a moment. It seemed like the dehexapods were doing well, and the battle would be equal, comma, yet there was one problem. Each time a dehexapod died, they would all get weaker. This would have a compounding effect, comma, if one was slain, then the next one was easier to kill. It seemed an even battle now, but soon it would snowball out of control and the poor twisted creatures would all probably die at once. With a resolute decisiveness, Jay made a decision. We've got to go in now, Jay made an icy stare at the small entrance of the pyramid. Can't we just wait and see? No, it will be too late then. We have to break through them while they're distracted. Let's move. Jay crept forward with his skeletons into the ruins on the right. Anya bit her lip but followed along anyway deciding to trust Jay. It wasn't like she had a choice anyway. She was the one following Jay along after all. All seven of them, comma, Jay, Anya and the five skeletons, comma, crept quietly around the small mounds of rubble in the ruins. They didn't want to be noticed by either the dehexapods or the stone statues. Jay had already begun to charge a few unstable teeth spells in his hand while they snuck through. Unlike the mysterious purple spells being launched by the floating statues, these were effective because they created a physical force, which was the explosion, followed by the tooth's enamel shrapnel. Jay led them closer to the pillar on the right. It would be better to push through the side, rather than through the middle, comma, there were also less dehexapod corpses here to jump over to. Still, it wouldn't be easy. Hum, this probably won't be enough. Jay thought as he looked at the charged teeth in his hand. What Jay did next made Anya look a little confused, as the skeletons all began handing their hammers to Jay, but she decided to keep quiet and just wait and see. 
With the hammers stashed away in Jay's inventory, he was ready. If one of the floating statues notices us, shoot a bolt at it and keep running. Jay whispered, adding one last order and try not to get hit. With a serious nod, Anya gripped her crossbow, ready to fire. Okay, let's move, Jay said. Suddenly, two humans and five undead were sprinting out of the ruins across the battlefield. Were they running from the skeletons? They went from crouching silently to sprinting madly at the wall of spearmen. Jay was initially in the lead, but the skeletons quickly caught up and overtook him. They knew exactly what to do, as Jay was commanding them with his mind while they charged. The stone statues didn't seem to be taken by surprise as the undead came charging. They reacted almost mechanically as they pointed their spears and raised their shields. To them, it was just another enemy of Holvisha which needed purging. The feeble creature had a spear thrust into its rib cage, but it survived, occupying a spearman temporarily comma at the same time. One of the higher level skeletons jumped at the statue. It clawed and grasped onto the statue's body, and soon wrapped itself around the statue's head, blocking whatever vision it had. This was something that did take the statue by surprise. Its spear was useless against something at such a close range. But it wouldn't drop its weapon comma perhaps. Its hands had even locked up. As they had been holding it for centuries. What it did next almost made Jay laugh as they continued to sprint towards the stone phalanx. The statue had no other options than to smash its own shield against its head. Trying to deal any damage to the skeleton it could. Shrew. A purple spell suddenly flew around the head of the statue, and ended up hovering inside the rib cage of the skeleton. Huh, Jay thought, is it meant to do damage, or hum? The spell still had no effect. Jay wasn't sure what to make of it. Either way, he was just glad it wasn't used on him. A second statue received a skeleton to the head. It also couldn't do anything to shake it off. Here, Jay yelled as he charged between them. Scree. The dehexapids noticed something strange was happening now too, and some began to charge over to the side. It seemed that the soldiers had partially broken their formation, and this was their opportunity to strike. Jay and Anya dashed through the wall of spearmen statues. Thankfully, the floating spell casting statue was still trying to cast its useless spells at the skeleton, since it was the first enemy that made it into its attack range. The spearmen statues on either side of the skeleton-covered statues started thrusting their spears into their allies' heads. This proved quite effective as they skeletons lost grip and were pushed off, though they still damaged their own kind. The feeble creature had died by this point, and another skeleton was soon to follow, comma, but it didn't matter to Jay. They had done their jobs quite well. It was a crazy tactic, but it worked. The dehexapids that had noticed the commotion were already attacking the preoccupied spearmen statues, taking advantage of the chaos. Jay didn't want to favor one side over the other, but it seemed that this was all the dehexapids needed to shift their battle in their favor. Two spearmen statues perished, followed by the rest of Jay's skeletons, and then two more statues. Chapter 166 Jay and Anya had made it to the entrance of the pyramid, and compared to the dehexapids they were now further away from the floating statues, comma, they wouldn't be targeted. They were safe for now at least. For a moment they watched the battle behind them, but after they broke the line of spearmen, they were now being decimated. Jay and Anya caused a weakness in their formation, which became the Helvetian soldiers undoing. The formation was what made them strong. But the dehexapids could now go around and attack from behind, while getting too close for the spears to even be effective. Before entering the pyramid, Jay quickly brought out a pile of bones and resummoned all his skeletons. Let's head inside before all the statues die, Jay said as he handed the skeletons their hammers and daggers back. Sure, Anya nodded and followed the skeletons inside with Jay. Like the other pyramids, this one was also dark inside, so Anya took out her brighter luminous orb. Lamp. Jay pointed at the luminous orb in Anya's hand. Thanks. Anya said as she let the skeleton carry it. The small passageway opened up into a large rectangular room, with pillars trailing down either side. As they cautiously crept between the pillars, two dual dagger stone statues suddenly stepped out from behind the pillars and slashed, taking the skeletons by surprise. Shring, 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 shring. It was an effective surprise attack as the skeletons took heavy damage before they could defend themselves. The skeletons jumped back and got into a fighting stance. 
Jay raised his shield and got into a defensive stance, checking for any other enemies in the hall about to ambush them. But it seemed like there were only the two dual dagger statues here. Hum, he squinted around the dark shadowy pillars, not trusting anything. Anya was already aiming her crossbow, but just before she fired, Jay suddenly stopped her. Save your bolts. Let the skeletons deal with this. He held his hand up. Anya lowered her crossbow, while the skeletons got to work. Blue began to effectively command Red, Sweeper and the level 1 feeble creature. First, Red and Sweeper attacked one statue each. Red took the left state and Sweeper took the right statue, taking the aggro and forcing the statues to target them. Next, Blue and the level 1 skeleton went behind the left statue and started smashing their hammers down on its back. The poor statue had no choice but to turn to face them. Unfortunately for the statue, its back was now wide open to red, which made it suffer for turning its back. Between blue, red and the level 1 feeble creature, the statue was basically spinning. What was once a fissum soldier turned into a useless punching bag. The feeble creature got a few slashes in, but its damage was minimal, almost not worth mentioning. Soon however, it found that stabbing was more effective than slashing against their dark stone bodies. It was a slight difference but was enough for it to continue this strategy, and now it was only stabbing. Despite having weapons quite effective to face a swarm, they had no choice but to accept their fate and give up their soul stones. They were simply outnumbered. The second statue could do nothing after its comrade died. It still did some damage to Sweeper, but it wasn't enough to create any kind of momentum. The four skeletons made short work of it as they turned its body back to rubble. 50x 50x since the skeletons didn't escape unharmed, Jay gave them a small bone pile to munch on while he, Anya and Lamp ventured a little further. Looking around on each wall of the room, were what seemed to be stone bookshelves and racks of some sort. After walking a little deeper into the room, they found a stone staircase in the very back, a set of stairs leading down and another leading up. Up or down? Anya asked. Down. Jay immediately made a choice. There wasn't any real difference between either choice. So wasting time thinking about it was just that comma a waste of time. This is what caused Jay to be so decisive for things like this. He couldn't imagine how much time would be wasted by adventurers arguing about such meaningless choices. Sure, there would likely be different things either way. But they had zero information, so the choice was the same. For these situations, Jay would easily just make a decision and go with it. By the time they clear the bottom level, perhaps other adventurers would still have been arguing. Wait here for a second, Jay said as he went back to collect the remains of the bone pile. After the skeletons ate their fill they were all in top condition again. Their armor was pristine, and they were ready to fight. The skeletons all headed back to the stairs and went down first, shortly followed by Jay and Anya. As they looked from the top of the stairs, they couldn't tell how deeply it would descend into the earth because of the darkness. But it didn't go down as far as they thought it might, maybe only one or two stories. The bottom floor opened into a wide passageway with a triangle ceiling. As they walked along the passage, they passed by some large stone tubs filled with loose rocks and earth, some of which had flecks of gleaming violet colors, reflecting in the light. Grabbing one, Jay inspected it closely and used his analysis skill, comma, yet no notification appeared. I guess it's useless. He shrugged, putting it back into the storage receptacle. He looked at the gleaming rocks once more, and then decided to take one with him, thinking it might look cool in the sunlight. Sparkling or X1. Hum, so it tells me what it is when I add it to my inventory. He squinted at the stone tub of ore before him. I wonder why the analysis didn't show anything. Is my analysis skill not good enough? Jay picked up another rock and looked at it, attempting another analysis. Perhaps I need a prospecting ability or something. He wondered, though his thoughts were quickly interrupted. G U R R R. A deep groaning sound resounded from somewhere below the floor of the room, and suddenly an opening formed in the wall behind the receptacle. A thick orange glow came from the wall opening, and without warning, the stone container flipped backwards, comma, all the ore was dumped into the wall opening, leaving an empty stone box right before the wall closed again, as if it all had never happened. Ah, uh, okay then. Jay turned his head to the side, a little confused as he held a chunk of the ore, before adding it to his inventory. Sparkling ore x1. I hope it wasn't a mistake to let all that stuff go. He thought as he scratched his chin. Hum, 
but maybe it is just a useless sparkly rock, he shrugged. As they walked, they passed by more and more of these empty stone tubs, all of them empty. It's getting warmer, Anya said. Yeah, it feels nice, Jay said, keeping the mood positive. Soon, they saw a faint glow in the distance at the end of the passage. It was small, and appeared as if a floating ember in the wind. As they proceeded towards it, they heard some faint rhythmic sounds in the distance. Dune 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 dune. As they got closer though it became a bit clearer. Sounding like metal banging on metal comma J. Didn't need to guess to know what it was. Why is there a blacksmith here it doesn't make any sense. All of the soldiers weapons are made from stone. He thought curious as they walked quietly. He could clearly hear the distinct sound of metal hitting metal. So Jay could only guess why none of the statues used any metal weapons. Surely they would be better than stone. Getting closer to the orange glow. They came to the entrance of the room. Two large stone twin doors stood before them. Each of them ornamental with an engraving of a hammer and anvil on one door and a sword on the other. Both were shut closed. And it turned out that the orange glow they were walking towards was a small circular opening above the doors. Jay had lamp give the luminous orb back to Anya. They wouldn't be needing it because of the orange light, while having another skeleton to fight would be useful. Jay calmly and quietly traced his hand over the large doors, taking a moment to appreciate the craftsmanship. The edges were sharp, and each line seemed to be perfectly cut. Ready. Jay whispered as he stood next to the large doors. Anya raised her crossbow and nodded back. Chapter 167. The ancient doors groaned open, altering everything nearby. The rhythmic pounding noises of a large metal hammer suddenly stopped. Jay and his party entered. The skeletons guarded them with a semi-circular formation and quickly scanned for enemies. The room was large, but despite its size, it was flooded with orange light, coming from an opening in the right side of the room. It was like a river of bubbling lava was just behind the wall. On the very right of the room was a large stone cube with a pool of the molten yellow substance on top. Some of it floated effortlessly above the pool and swirled around, forming a molten cylinder, perfect for inserting a sword into for forging. Various engravings, runes and metallic symbols covered the cube, each of them shimmering slowly. Which is probably what gave the yellow molten fluid its gravity-defying abilities. Near it, a metal anvil was sitting. It was much larger than a normal anvil to suit the giant weapons being hammered with it. Some tool racks with various oversized metal instruments and other blacksmith equipment were nearby, as well as a thick stone table and a black pool of oil and stagnated water. It was a blacksmith forge fit for an expert. Despite there being a metalworking forge, the room was littered with stone weapons of all different shapes and sizes, most of which were nothing more than rubble on the ground. It was almost like the blacksmith was disappointed in its own work, as it didn't even bother racking them. Between all of these stood what they came here for. A large stone statue stood there with thick engraved armor and a large stone belly. Seemingly, it was angered by intruders distracting its work. Its eyes were like blazing embers which gazed at them with a tense focus. Compared to the other soldiers in Helvetia it seemed quite distinguished based on its thicker and ornamental armor. Patterns of trees, magic and towers were all over it. What was strange about the large statue was that it wasn't holding its hammer with its gauntlet. It was holding a pair of metal tongs, which held its hammer. In its other hand, it held a long glowing piece of metal. Oh, Jay thought, thinking that it should be using the tongs to hold the hot metal instead of its hammer. It seemed that the heat didn't affect its stone body comma but why use tongs to hold a hammer? The large statue turned around and set its metal hammer down next to the anvil with a deep thud and a low ring. Next, it grabbed one of the stone weapons nearby comma it was another hammer. The only difference is that it was stone instead of metal. Strange Jay thought, looking for any clues. There were no other enemies in the room, so Jay decided to let Blue lead the attack again. The skeletons all marched forward with their own hammers, surrounding the large statue as it stomped forward in response, each of its own steps creating deep thudding sounds coursing through the room. Anya was ready to launch a bolt as soon as the skeletons attacked and took the enemy's aggression, meanwhile Jay took this opportunity to analyze the statue. Hesvan, level 8, HP 700 700, armor 500, skills. Water Spear, comma, nullified. This spell is no longer usable. Guided Hammer, comma, passive. Continuous usage of hammers provides a damage bonus. Plus 7% damage with hammers. 
Eternal Forger, comma, passive. Many lifetimes spent in the forge has caused a change. 100% heat resistance. Bulwax Vine, comma, passive. My armor is an extension of myself. I even sleep in it. I am one with it. 15% of armor converted into bonus health. Restless Strength, comma, passive. Unstoppable, unmovable. Crowd control abilities have no effect. Tool bond. A master craftsman has become one with their tools. The bond grows stronger the longer the tools are used. Plus 322% efficiency. 1 slash 2 tools bound. Brittle armor. 40% damage reduction to slashing, stabbing damage. 20% more damage taken from crushing damage. Holvisha's revenge. Magic damage immune. Any wielded weapons become cursed. Description. An honored servant of the Helvetian king, turned to stone. A once legendary blacksmith, now purely relying on instinct to forge. Time passes, but the hammer continues to strike. Hesvan works tirelessly, forging weapons for the king's great revenge. Huh, no active abilities well? There is that war to one, but I guess it lost the ability after it turned to stone. Jay squinted at it, scratching his chin. Compared to the spearmen and swordsmen statues, this one seemed very well fed, at least before it turned to stone anyway. It had thicker limbs and a large stone belly, all covered by its thick gothic ornamental armor. Unlike other statues, it had no helmet. It would probably be too cumbersome when crafting, and it was bald with a thick stone beard. With the statue surrounded, the skeletons crept closer to begin their attacks, but the statue took the initiative and lunged forward. Boom. With a sideways swing. Its stone hammer instantly connected. The feeble creature was instantly smashed to pieces, its spine flying into a wall and falling apart. Shit. Jay thought as he quickly resummoned it. The level 1 skeleton had 15 health and no armor. So it was hard to determine how much damage was actually done, comma, until another hammer swing came flying at Sweeper. Sweeper dropped its hammer as it was similarly sent flying, though it maintained its form as it slammed against a wall. Despite its rib cage being mostly snapped off and one of its hands lying on the ground, it instantly jumped back into the fight. Jay smiled seeing how his minions just didn't care about being wounded. If they were human it would count as being mortally wounded if they were living. No human could ever hope to match their tenacity, or how quickly they could jump right back into a fight. The statue had quite a different reaction as it saw that its damage was merely superficial. Shouldn't they stay down for at least a moment to recover? The statue had never fought the undead before, and it definitely didn't expect them to be entering its forge. What happened to the guards? Surely they wouldn't have fallen to a small force of undead and two humans. Nevertheless, they were here now and it would fight. The thirst for Helvetia's revenge still was not quenched. Seeing that the skeletons wouldn't go down so easily, it immediately changed its tactics. It swung again at red as it dashed to a corner. The swing missed though, as it was simply trying to clear a path to a more defensible position. Jay analyzed Sweeper to check just how hard the statue was hitting. HP 38 slash 60. Damn, 22 damage. Good thing it missed red. Jay nodded, seeing red dodge jump to the side. The skeletons used to have 5 bonus HP from the Silt Wolf bones, but now they relied on Jay's new armor, giving them 20 extra HP. It was a good trade-off once they evolved into fully formed skeletons. Without the armor they would only be able to take 2 hits, and being able to take an extra hit was a huge difference, especially since collectively, they could take an extra 4 hits. The skeletons had managed to get in a few hits of their own comma though, it was clear this was going to be a long fight, after Jay saw their damage numbers. 444. Abysmal. He pursed his lips, seeing the pathetic damage. This will be a long fight. Chapter 168. Dwoosh. Thankfully, Anya was there and she dealt piercing damage. All the armor of the statue counted for nothing, and the brittle armor passive had no effect on ranged attacks. A heavy bolt shot forward and ignored the armor as it punctured right through it, creating a borehole, as it struck deeply into the stone blacksmith's large stomach. The statue was in a corner now, which was a much more defensible position, though after the bolt pierced its stomach, it looked directly at Anya as if warning her, even daring her to shoot another comma before, going back to striking at the pesky skeletons, with its large stone hammer. With its back protected it began to fight back, each swing causing heavy damage to the skeletons, comma, but after being flattened, they instantly spring back up, retaliating with their own powerful strikes. 
boom comma doon. It would periodically miss, creating tremors throughout the room. It definitely had lower dexterity than the skeletons. But it was still a level 8 opponent, so its strikes would sometimes land on the nimble undead skeletons. Blue was doing slightly more damage than the other skeletons, chunking off parts of its armor slowly. It was level 4 now, so it was dealing more damage. 5.35.3 Another bolt struck the creature, dealing massive damage. And causing it to pause for a moment as it recoiled from the hit, this only served to let the skeletons freely attack, getting in more easy damage. It glanced at Anya again after taking more damage from her. Once it was done with these skeletons, she would be the next to die. But for now, it just had to focus on culling the skeletons. Shortly into the fighting, a skeleton had finally been slain, comma, but Jay just resummoned it. It rejoined the battle with the same intense vigor it had died with, and only a moment passed between its death and summoning. The statue gazed at Jay next, slowly realizing that killing the skeletons would be pointless. After seeing that taking the skeletons out would not be effective, the statue played more defensively for a moment while it analyzed the battlefield. Between a few horizontal swings to keep the skeletons at a distance, it would briefly glance at Anya and Jay, who would it kill first. After the next bolt came flying and piercing its stone chestplate, it made its move. Dune, Dune, Dune. Each of its steps was heavy as it marched forward uncaringly. The skeletons made the most of it as they basically had free reign to attack it. Tink tink tink. They bashed their hammers against its heavily armored back and took away more chips of stone along with some of its health points. 4445.32.2.2.2 Hum. The statue wasn't moving towards Jay or Onya comma instead. It was going to the forge area. Its head was fixated on the metal hammer. Jay recalled what happened with Estoba. It might be interesting to see what would happen once it reached its metal hammer. But it was simply too risky. Nope, not this time. Jay thought as he instantly commanded a skeleton. The skeleton hopped across and made it to the hammer first, comma, it tried to grab it with one hand. But it didn't budge, so it dropped its bone hammer and used two hands. Nothing. No movement at all. It may as well have been fixed to the ground. The hammer was simply too heavy. How the hell was it lifting it with just a pair of tongs? Jay's brows creased in confusion. The statue was coming. So the skeleton gave up on its prize and grabbed its bone hammer again before dashing away. Just before the statue grabbed the hammer, it hesitated for a moment as it gazed at the metal hammer. It was about to dual wield two hammers. As it reached out its hand paused for a moment, comma, though as another hammer strike from the skeletons came down on its back. It shook its head and grabbed it instantly, before swinging around behind itself. The hammer was instantly coated in a faint golden aura. It was hard to see because of the orange light from the forge, but it was definitely there. Boom. It smashed right through two skeletons, ending them instantly. What the fuck? Jay said as he watched two skeletons turning to flying bones in one attack. He instantly resummoned the destroyed skeletons. The statue was now looking directly at him. As it walked forward, the hammer slowly stopped glowing golden. It became faint before pulsing for a moment, and suddenly disappearing. Next, the metal shine the hammer was giving off before disappeared. Jay looked a little more closely, and noticed that it had dark grey veins now traveling through it. It was turning to stone, and the grey veins now growing through it were beginning to look like the other stone hammer it was dual wielding. Dune, dune, dune. It walked faster towards Jay who suddenly realized what would happen. The curse of Holvisha's revenge was changing its last metal hammer to stone, comma, this was why it used the metal tongs to hold it awkwardly. Due to its blacksmith experience, the metal hammer in its hands was much more dangerous than some cursed stone imitation. If the hammer connected with him with it was still metal, it would end in instant death. If he evaded long enough, it would be a battle of attrition until he wins. It was over once the hammer turned fully to stone. Basically, there was a time limit for the statue to slay Jay within. It decided to go for Jay first, as Anya would be helpless without Jay. Because she was immobile when she reloaded her bow. How would she do damage if she kept having to run away? Once the necromancer was gone, it could just walk towards her until she either died or left the dungeon. Of course, it still needed the annoying necromancer to die. The statue was like a moving mountain, a wall of death heading right towards him. All Jay could do was flee from it. Instead of moving into another part of the room, Jay headed back into the passageway. 
Anya decided to move into another corner of the room and continue to fire. In the event of the blacksmith statue turning on her she would be fine. Since she had her black mist ability, as well as her unique skill. Just keep shooting it. Jay called as he reached the twin doors. Chapter 169. Dune Dune Dune. The blacksmith continued to march at Jay with its dual hammers at either sides. It was a bulky statue, but it was still huge nonetheless. Each of its steps was akin to jogging speed. The four skeletons continued to chunk away at the statue, and a bolt in the back only served to push it forward towards Jay. The metal hammer had veins of rock beginning to grow through it more as it was falling to the curse. It was spreading fast, comma, but Jay and the statue were already in the hallway and heading towards the stairs. Still, Jay wasn't too worried. While it was like a walking mountain, it was still slow. He just had to trust Anya and his skeletons while staying out of danger. Doon doon doon. Jay passed by the empty containers. As he went further from the furnace light, it was getting dark again. The statue looked even more sinister in the darkness, as all he could see was a giant silhouette of an armored monster, dual wielding two hammers. He only had his small luminous orb to guide him through the darkness, which he quickly took out. The statue gripped its pride at joy, its last metal hammer. It had to sacrifice it to save itself, but unfortunately it realized that it wouldn't catch the necromancer before they reached the end of the passage. It had to do something or otherwise it would all be for nothing. It swung its stone hammer back before taking a heavy step forward, planting its foot into the shattering ground. Foolosh. It released the hammer as it swung, sending it flying at Jay. It made a humming sound as it sped through the air at a high speed. The statue had high strength but low dexterity, so it was powerful but not accurate, though against all odds it connected with its target. Boom. Skulich. Gra Fuuki clenched his jaw so hard that blood dripped out in his spit. Jay's leg instantly exploded and turned to paste. The necrotic Vambrus was similarly smashed to brittle bits of bone. It happened so fast that it was like his brain didn't even realize something was wrong, as he walked on his exposed leg bone for a moment before collapsing helplessly on the ground. Minus 18. Dune, Dune, Dune. The statue marched a little more slowly and a little more confidently, now that its target was maimed. What could it do? Run. Unbeknownst to the blacksmith statue, Jay also had high vitality, comma, and that only meant high regeneration. Dune, Dune, Dune. Come on, heal you bastard. Jay yelled at his leg. Dune, Dune, Dune. The statue's march was unstoppable despite all the bolts sticking in its back and the skeletons harassing it. Some unstable teeth spells slowed it down for a moment, but it simply wasn't enough. Finally, it made it to Jay. Slowly it raised its arm to end him as it winded up a powerful swing. In an act of desperation, Jay immediately went all out. First, he summoned a pile of bones on top of himself, comma, maybe. It would block some damage. Next, he resummoned all the skeletons on top of the bone pile, each of them standing in the way of the hammer strike. Finally, Deathwalker's sentry came out. He loosely held it around his head and chest area. This was all he could do as he winced from the pain and braced himself for the hit. The bone pile was pushing against his blood stump of a leg, but for now he could do nothing about it. To hurt Jay, it would have to make it through the skeletons, the bones, Deathwalker's sentry, his armor, and his 70 plus health. Boom. Your skeleton has died. Your skeleton has died. Your skeleton has died. Your feeble creature has died. Minus 9. Gritting his teeth under the bone pile. He exhaled as he took some mostly superficial damage from the weight of the crushing bones above. One skeleton was still left on top after the heavy smash, so there was still a slight buffer for any damage from the hammer. He survived the first hit, but another would follow. Jay immediately resummoned the skeletons as he braced for another hit. Prostrate. Finally, Anya was here. Dune. The heavy statue immediately knelt down, bowing to the authority of a higher power. Jay and his skeletons had prior permission to move under her unique skill, so he immediately stored the bone pile. Much of his leg had regrown. It was just missing a foot now. Jay, I can't hold it for long. It has strong loyalty. Anya yelled from somewhere behind the statue. Jay didn't understand what she meant about loyalty, but he didn't need to comma he only had to know that he didn't have much time. He had to move as far away from the statue as possible to buy himself some time to heal. After looking at his skeletons around him, a slight grin appeared on his face as he thought of something, 
His new orders communicated immediately through his mind. Each of the skeletons grabbed one of his limbs and lifted him up. The feeble creature went underneath and pushed up on his back. Jay was basically crowd surfing on his skeletons which proceeded to carry him past the blacksmith. A smug grin flashed at the blacksmith's statue as he was quickly carried away. At this moment he felt like Matheson, mocking him through his carriage window. Eek. Shit. On the toy. He said with a hint of malice as he spat. The spit coated the statue's face as he passed by. It made a satisfying wet slap sound as it splattered onto the blacksmith's stone face. For just a moment the blacksmith's body shuddered. But it was still held in place by Anya's unique ability. Jay had the skeletons carry him behind the blacksmith all the way back into the forge room. The five skeletons worked together seamlessly. It was like they were part of a perfectly choreographed performance as they carried Jay. He was only moving slightly slower than what he could run at. It was uncomfortable, but right now he would gladly trade comfort for speed and safety. Anya was reloading her crossbow as she watched him being carried. Seeing his face having a cheeky grin on it, she could only shake her head and roll her eyes and follow him back. Jay had his skeleton put him down back of the blacksmith room near the forge, he kept the feeble skeleton with him for support, leaning on its head with one arm, as he sent off the rest of the skeletons to fight. They grabbed their hammers and went off to finish the battle. Chapter 170 Despite always giving 100%, the skeletons seemed to be filled with even more bloodlust than usual. Something had dared to hurt their master, and their desire for revenge was even more inflamed by their fellow undead joining them for the revenge crusade. All four of them charged madly down the hallway, including Blue. It was an all-out attack with zero concern for self-preservation. The blacksmith statue was free from Anya's prostrate ability, and prepared as its enemies charged towards it. Not that the statue knew, but the first skeleton coming was Red. Red jumped up high with its hammer raised above its skull, bringing forward a downward swing, going right for the statue's head comma yet. It never landed the hit. Boom. The blacksmith's stone hammer swung sideways, easily smashing red into the wall comma but blue, followed right after and landed a heavy hit, catching the statue completely off guard. Crack. A critical hit. It was like blue had planned this, using a weaker skeleton to take the hit, so it would be free to deal damage. A large chunk of stone bounced off the statue's shoulder as half of its jaw was shattered away. The blacksmith's metal hammer and its other hand was almost completely stone now, and it swung it back quickly. Blue knew the hit was coming from its second hammer. But it didn't care. It had done its job. Cause massive damage, protect its master. Boom. Blue was like a ragdoll as it smashed against the other wall, ending up on the opposite wall to red. Since the hammer was mostly stone now, it only did normal damage. And Blue miraculously survived. Since the blacksmith's superweapon turned to stone, the threat of the blacksmith was essentially over. The statue continued to march towards Jay. While Sweeper and Lamp were ignored as they hacked away at the statue's arms and legs, chipping away some more of its health along with some stone fragments. All the damage was taking its toll on the statue. It was on its last legs and was slowing down. It began to realize the plan to kill the necromancer had failed. Each of its swings were getting slower and weaker as its life force began to leave its cold stone body. Its last metal hammer had finally turned to stone. The curse was complete. It quickly realized it wasn't going to make it through this. But this didn't mean it couldn't take a few more enemies with it. Boom. Vengeful indignation and bitter hatred almost seemed to create an aura around its body, as it suddenly smashed both hammers into the ground, implanting them into the earth. The blacksmith gave up its hammers. Next, it grabbed two of the skeletons. Years or forging made its grip unbreakable. Sweeper and Lamp had no choice as they were crushed against its body, while it jumped into one of the stone or containers. All the skeletons could do was wriggle against its strength. Red and Blue were trying to free their comrades as they stood at the edge of the stone container and smashed away at it. But it was all for nothing. The wall suddenly opened, and a familiar orange glow flowed out, accompanied by heat. Slowly but surely, the stone box flipped backwards. The blacksmith, two skeletons and two bone metal hammers, all fell into the intense heat coming from the wall. Your skeleton has been slain. Your skeleton has been slain. 800x. Damn it, Jay thought as he saw the notifications. Pretty lame way to die. He pursed his lips. Crafting those two bone hammers cost him two metal ingots. Sure, losing two skeletons was annoying. 
but it was now considered a small thing to Jay. Hundreds of thousands of skeletons remained in his gauntlet, but he would have to leave the dungeon again, if he wanted more of the hammers. Anya was quite pleased with the large experience boost, but she saw Jay only frowning after the notifications. They split the experience, but it was still a lot nonetheless, so she assumed it was because of all his skeletons suffering. Hum, he must really care about his skeletons, she thought, deciding to say nothing about it. Hum, Jay looked at the forge area, an idea crossing his mind. The glowing lava was mesmerizing as it floated up and down on top of the enchanted stone cube. I only need some ingots to make more hammers right. So why not? He thought as he approached it. As Jay drew near, the heat coming from it was intense. His face was immediately dried out, and some traces of steam wisps were leaving his clothes. Jay grabbed what seemed like an industrial ladle from the tool rack near the forge. Pulling out the two chunks of sparkling ore he grabbed, he dropped them in, but realized it simply wouldn't be enough. For a moment he frowned, but then he looked at all the tools around him, and his lips began to curl. Unlike the stone weapons, these were still made of metal. Jay was glad that Helvetia's curse only affected weapons. With a smile he hopped around and grabbed them, adding them to the large ladle he was going to melt them all in. If the blacksmith could see Jay now it would probably forget all about Helvetia's revenge, and come back from the dead just to murder him. These were his precious tools, his lifelong accomplices that he took care of, and which took care of him. Now they were being used to make more pulley crafted hammers for some undead comma they wouldn't even appreciate them. How could someone do this? As Jay brought the ladle near the floating lava on top of the room covered cube, the lava all moved as it responded to the approaching ladle. It turned into a bowl shape so the ladle could sit on the top. Not bad Jay thought with a nod Holvisha Shaw was advanced. He placed it in, and it only took a moment before the contents all became a silvery liquid. There was some gunk on the top, but he scraped it off. He wasn't sure what it was, but his instinct told him it was probably trash. Jay looked around and found some molds to pour the liquid into. None of them had hammer shapes, but there was something shaped like an ingot, so he opted for that. Thankfully, Anya waited patiently as she watched. She didn't have much else to do. But it wasn't like she had a choice either, without Jay she would definitely not get this far. The molten metal flowed into the molds with ease, it was quite straightforward. A few moments later his ingots were crafted. He had some liquid metal left over, but he just left it in the ladle. Helvetian steel ingot comma 84% purity x2. 84%. Jay frowned as he analyzed the ingots. He could see the tiny flakes from the sparkling ore in it but it seemed that there simply wasn't enough for any meaningful change. It was probably what made up the other 16% of the ingot, or at least some of it. Perhaps I can't analyze too much about the ingot, maybe I just need some more blacksmithing experience. Still, he couldn't complain as these were steel, much stronger than the iron bars he purchased from Lillian at the guild. I wonder what the hammers will be like. He thought as he sat down and prepared to craft his new weapons. Chapter 171 Anya waited patiently nearby as Jay sat down next to a pile of bones. He resummoned his dead skeletons and began working on their new hammers. It was a faster process since he knew how to craft them, and already had the designs in his head. But they both came out as higher quality bone hammers. It seemed that the combination of steel ingot and his level 3 scrimshaw skill resulted in a better product. Bone hammer level 3, comma steel ingot x2. 10 damage comma crushing, bludgeoning, 0.1 damage comma elemental, 5% chance to stun or cripple targets comma dependent on point of impact, lifespan comma requires necrotic essence to maintain its form, current lifespan, 20 hours, not bad Jay said as he admired his handiwork, the steel part of the makeshift necrotic hammer, still gave off little glints of light, it seemed that the residual sparkling ore gave a small elemental damage bonus, Still, the 10 damage was a massive boost in power, compared to the other bone hammers, which were doing 6 damage. It was even stronger than Jay's Osane arming sword now. Jay decided to make himself a better hammer, using his necrotic mana. He melted away the bone from one of the other ones, and saved the iron bar, before using it to craft another. Bone hammer level 2, comma iron bar. 8. Damage, comma crushing, bludgeoning. 5% chance to stun or cripple targets, comma dependent on point of impact. 
Lifespan comma requires necrotic essence to maintain its form. Current lifespan, 10 hours. Not too bad. Jay nodded, standing up again. He would have recrafted the others, but he decided to save his mana. He was getting low from all the summoning and crafting. With one last look around the room, there really was nothing worth taking. All the metal tools would not enter his inventory, and hence could not leave the dungeon. It was almost like the most lucrative rewards were at the start, when he could have taken all the sparkling ore. Basically it was like a reverse dungeon. Still, the X was worth it to fight the boss for. Jay would have done it differently if he knew how powerful it was, but in the end it was worth it. Have you finished crafting your things? Anya asked with a yawn. Yeah, let's see what's up the stairs. Jay pointed to the passageway. They both walked back down the passage they came down. Though Jay gave one last look at the cube forge. It was an impressive piece of magical technology after all. When they made it back to the stairs, they entered stealth mode again. Jay and Anya cautiously crept up the stone stairs to the top floor this time. They didn't know what to expect. But if it was anything like the blacksmith statue, there would be a possibility of instant death. It was pitch black again, and Jay decided to hand his cheaper luminous orb to the feeble creature. It could do the scouting for them, since they couldn't see very far ahead anyway. A safety precaution of sorts. Jay wasn't exactly sure how the statues had any vision at all. But it seemed that neither light nor darkness made a difference to them. Which worked in their favor as seeing a glowing orb across the room would have been like a beacon. Reaching the top of the stairs, they looked around, and to their fear, they entered a room full of weapon racks combo all, covered with glistening Helvetian steel weapons. Most of the swords and spears were the ones they typically saw the soldier statues carrying, but among them were a few daggers, and other odd weapons comma some, looked like fists with spikes on them, while others were sickle-shaped attached to long chains. One of them was just a metal hat with a sharpened rim, very edgy. Jay was slowly getting ideas for future weapons for his minions, but Anya had other thoughts. Imagine if the blacksmith was up here she whispered. Jay didn't nod or respond to her whisper. He knew it would have been fine, since the blacksmith was bonded with its hammers, which is why it was so powerful, but he decided to say nothing. It would take too long to explain, and it wouldn't change anything anyway. Finally they spotted the first enemies. Some stone statues which had no legs or lower torso, simply floated around. Each of their T-shaped helmets had distinctive wings pointing upwards from the ears. While their hands came equipped with spindly claw armor comma though, in this case, it would be more accurate to call them claw weapons. Two of these floating statues were rushing about busily. Each of their long claw gauntlets working with various weapons and tools. Jay and Anya hid behind a spear rack as they watched them move about. One would grab a metal weapon from the rack, and it would wait a moment as it turned to stone due to the Helvetia curse, before handing it to the other. The other would sharpen it on a circular grinding stone, attempting to restore some of its former pre-curse glory. A sense of sadness grew in Jay, as he saw the lovely weapons being massively downgraded into stone variants. It seemed that the curse would make the pristine weapons become blunt and round, so after they turned to stone, the sharpening process was necessary. Still, much of their quality and damage was lost. The weapons were like shadows of their former selves. This production process would have been implemented after the curse. Jay thought as he patiently watched. The floating statue then carried the stone weapons to different weapon racks deeper into the room. Huh. But what's the point if there's no new soldiers? Jay scratched his chin as he squinted. Looking around at the weapons around him, a mischievous grin appeared on Jay's face as he attempted to add every single weapon around him into his inventory. Unfortunately he couldn't. These weapons were also part of the dungeon. Fair enough he shrugged, becoming rich overnight shouldn't be so easy. Before planning anything, Jay diligently analyzed the enemies. Embroidered Truth Guards, level 5. HP 70 70. Damage. 5, Claw Gauntlet. Skills. Seeking Toxin. Poisons enemies from afar, weakening them for the guards to finish. Ignores armor. 4 poison damage per second. Can stack comma 4 times. Duration. 4 seconds. Rend. Uses its claw gauntlets to slash frantically at enemies, cleaving deep into the flesh. Ignores armor. 5 flat damage. 5 bleed damage slash 2 seconds. Can stack comma 4 times. Duration. 4 seconds. Description. 
Only the most esteemed Helvetian upper mages went through the process to transform into the Truth Guards. Before the transformation ritual, they will go through another procedure in which their mana pool is ripped out, their mortal bodies tremble endlessly from the pain. Their mana pool is melded with a forbidden metal, and is then fused onto their new stone bodies. They are weakened from the process and are merely relics of their former selves. But their desire to keep their mana is almost as strong as their thirst for revenge. Hum, forbidden metal hard Jay squinted at them. I will just have to scrape it off their bodies he thought as he smiled fiendishly. Jay and Anya crept a little further away so they could plan an attack. The enemies had quite low health compared to some other monsters, so they weren't very alarmed. Hiding behind some shield racks, they came up with a plan. It was a relatively simple strategy. Attack the one grinding while the other went to fetch a weapon, comma, let the skeletons do all the attacking until the enemies targeted Jay. Then Anya could get to work doing heavy crossbow damage. After they were done with their hushed whispering they crept back again, and waited till the grinding statue was alone. Now, Jay mentally yelled a thought command to his skeletons. Each of the skeletons rushed from behind different weapon racks, and slammed their hammers against the statue's back, instead of falling forward like one might expect. This was a floating statue comma it went spinning helplessly across the room, smashing into some weapon racks, and causing destruction to the equipment. Nice. Jay grinned, seeing how his skeletons made it pathetically crumple against their hammers. If it had a spine it would have been shattered. However the battle wasn't over comma the statue wasn't dead, while the banging sounds of the falling weapons alerted everything in the room. Dune dune dune. It turns out that the two floating statues were not the only ones here. Something had been awakened. More heavy footsteps sounded approaching from the back of the room. Hum Jay squinted trying to see anything. The second hovering statue was already beginning to cast its poison spells on the skeletons, though they were still completely ineffective. Would their spells work on the undead? Of course not. Like the other stone soldiers in this dungeon, it was clear that they had lost their intelligence with the passage of time. Perhaps they had other useful offensive spells before, but these would have been long forgotten. The purple spells harmlessly floated into the skeleton rib cages before dispersing into nothingness. TCHJ shook his head pitying the floating statues. All this time he had a bone pile next to him and was ready to summon skeletons. But it seems that for now he was overprepared. Still, this would have been difficult for a normal party of adventurers, as the truth guards could deal as much as 16 damage per second with their poison spell. But for Jay, it was as easy as a walk in the park. All he had to do was watch and wait. Dune Dune Dune, Chapter 172 the statue that was sneak attacked by the skeletons went flying and was already close to death. After doing a few pitiful slashing attacks with its claws it died miserably, contributing almost nothing to the fight. The skeletons had a few scratches on their armor, but that was it. It seems these statues were designed to fight against living targets, causing damage over time effects with their poison, and then bleeding them to death. There was one thing though which didn't make sense to Jay. The stone statues were magic resistant, so how could they cast spells? Looking a little more closely at the one casting a spell, Jay found the answer. They were invisible at first, but as mana was pushed into spells some faint blue veins spread over the statue's arm. It seemed they were coated in some sort of mana conducting material. Interesting Jay sneakily squinted at it. His inner necromancer was impressed. However he had no use for such a material, as his skeletons already could sense mana, each of them having their own mana pools. So surely the skeletons could use spells. Jay wondered. A mischievous smile grew on his face as he imagined how insanely strong they would be if they started casting magic. But first, I will need to learn a purely mana based spell myself. He shrugged reminding himself to copy his necrotic helmet's spell. Dune Dune Dune. A large statue was approaching from the back of the room, but it would be too late comma the second floating statue was getting bullied by the four skeletons. The spellcaster types were usually much weaker in melee combat, and this one in particular looked almost like it was suffering, as it slashed at whatever it could, but it was all for nothing. 85. X. Suddenly a stone sword came flying powerfully from the darkness, silent until it connected with a skeleton. Crunch. Boom. The sword carried the skeleton and penetrated deeply into a weapon rack pinning the skeleton. Sweeper was desperately trying to pull the sword out or its body off, but before it could do anything to get free, 
But there was no hope for it now. Boom boom. Crack. Two more stone swords flew at it like perfectly thrown javelins. Sweeper only had one more hit left till it died. But that would probably be a better option, as right now it was pinned by three stone swords. If it was resummoned it could at least fight. Jay was watching but remained cool-headed and calculating. It was only one skeleton so far, so things were still manageable. He had the feeble creature dash further towards wherever the swords came from. It was still carrying Jay's luminous orb, and he wanted to see what was coming. Boom. A flying sword zoomed right towards the feeble creature, but it nimbly ducked behind the weapon racks, avoiding any damage. It wasn't only quick and agile, but it was a small target too. It would even be hard for Anya to hit it. After weaving in and out of the weapon racks, the feeble creature finally brought the light close enough to reveal the statue. It was not as bulky as the blacksmith statue, but its armor was just as decorative, covered in different patterns of steel grass, eyes and five swords. In each of its hands were long-clawed gothic gauntlets, while two floating stone swords were hovering in mid-air next to them. Boom. It launched another floating sword at the feeble creature, comma, this time hitting it. The feeble creature was pinned down, a sword sticking into its rib cage. It dropped the luminous orb, which thankfully rolled towards the statue, illuminating it even more. It seemed the swords didn't do a lot of damage, and were mostly for immobilizing enemies. Since the feeble creature didn't die in one hit, the small skeleton survived the brutal attack, but only for a moment. With the sword pinning it down another was well on the way. It had zero chance to dodge, and all it could do was accept its fate. Boom. A direct hit right in between its rat skull eyes ended its desperate struggle. Your feeble creature has died. Damn. Don't get pinned down Jay thought. A simple lesson. Jay had quietly made a bone pile next to him and he resummoned the feeble creature along with Sweeper. Instead of having them rush directly back in, Jay had them run around to other areas in the room before rejoining the fight. This would serve to hide his location as he continued to summon. 85. X. By now, the second floating statue was a pile of expensive rubble on the floor, and the skeletons were dashing towards their next target. The sword slinging statue. Boom! Exclamation point dot boom. Blue ducked under a sword as it slipped right past its shoulder, landing in a weapon rack somewhere behind it. Another sword struck red, taking it out of the fight for a moment, comma, thankfully there were no weapon racks behind it. So it was only pushed back and took some damage. Red was already sprinting towards the statue, but it still went about 10 meters backwards, comma, 32 feet from the raw force. After scrambling to get its body off the sword, Red was already running back into the battle again. Swoosh! Exclamation point crack. Two floating swords swept across the air in front of the statue in a scissor motion. Lamp was decapitated, but its skeletal body still charged forward. Lamp's headless body got a hit in, but that statue quickly realized it was still alive, so it sent a sword flying at Lamp's skull lying on the ground. Boom. Needless to say, it was a critical hit. Your skeleton has died. Sullivan gazed at Villader across his desk trying to figure out why he was so invested in Jay. Why do you want to go into dungeons with Jay? It's unusual for you to leave the guild at all. Doesn't your research take priority? Ah, uh, yes. I am interested in his abilities. Perhaps it can shed some light on my research. Villader nodded with a light smile. His abilities. Sullivan leant his hand on his chin. It will be too suspicious. We already registered him as a melee class. Sullivan nodded. Well, we could just dash. No. Sullivan's voice was soft but filled with power, and Villader could only clench his jaw. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about? Sullivan glared across the desk. Villader only shook his head as he got up and left with a bitter frown. Chapter 173 the large statue was launching sword after sword at the skeletons, keeping them at a distance for the most part. More and more swords floated off a nearby weapon rack to replace the ones it lost. But they were quickly sent flying at Blue's head as well as the other skeletons. The skull was a smaller target, so it was harder to hit. Blue only tilted its skull to the side to evade, but its necrotic helmet still took a graze. Jay was too far away to analyze the large statue but he already understood the danger of the upper floor. Get pinned down, and the truth guards will make you poisoned and bleed to death. Thankfully the truth guards were already slain by now. Other adventurers would have probably taken their time in dealing with them carefully and tactfully, to not take poison or bleed damage, 
and would end up just giving time for the sword levitating statue to attack. But this wasn't true for the undead. The statue continued to blend the air around its body with its flying swords. The sword attacks were not as damaging as the truth guards. But it would still be hard to kill this boss, as its crowd control skills were advanced. SHHHH, boom. A skeleton got close, but not close enough. The statue narrowly avoided taking a hammer strike, as it swept another skeleton away with one sword, before pinning it to the ground with the other. Its tactic was quite simple. It would spin two swords around its body to keep the skeletons at bay, before launching one when it found an opening. Jay quickly resummoned his minions whenever they were getting pinned down or dying. Multiple skeleton remains decorated the walls, ground and weapon racks of the room, pinned to them by the stone swords. Slowly they began accumulating in the room, making it seem like an ancient grand battle had happened here. Jay grinned as he thought of a solution, realizing the weakness of this boss. The statue will definitely shit itself he smiled like a devil. Lamp was summoned again, and Jay quickly put his plan into action. Here, Jay handed his own hammer to the skeleton before sending it off with its own special orders. It wasn't long before Lamp was hard at work. Clank, on the clank, on the clank. The other skeletons were busy distracting the statue. But after a short pause the statue suddenly released two swords, sending them rocketing towards Lamp. Car boom. Lamp evaded easily and ignored it as it continued its special mission. Clank. It was destroying the stone hammers on the weapon racks. Needless to say, the statue went crazy. Bow boom, bow boom, bow boom. It began launching as many floating swords as it could at Lamp, completely giving up on defense. In the meantime it took massive damage. But it had to save its precious swords comma without them. It wouldn't be able to launch any more. The annoying skeleton was smashing up its ammunition. Suddenly, it stopped taking any damage from the other skeletons. And it seemed like its worst fears came to life, comma, all of the skeletons suddenly ignored it and began smashing up the stone swords in the room. Jay almost laughed and gave away his position as he watched this happening. These weren't actually his orders, but it was Blue who was commanding the other skeletons. It basically copied Jay's idea. Jay could only shake his head with a smile as the skeletons each dashed off in different directions in the room and got to work. The statue was frantically marching around now launching whatever swords it could find in the direction of any skeletons it could see. It was practically shitting itself. Jay even began to pity it, but he was still smirking, feeling quite superior. So far, all he did was summon his skeletons while he and Anya quietly watched, and because the skeletons charged at the enemy from different directions his location was never found. The statue probably didn't even know it was dealing with a necromancer and was probably thinking it was in some sort of nightmare. Bonk, clank, clank, bonk, clank. All around the room, the stone weapons were being destroyed. The skeletons were as proficient at destruction as they were at killing. At some point, the statue stopped launching the swords, comma, it had to maintain two to defend itself efficiently. The sounds of stone swords being broken slowly quieted down, and it was this point in the fight where Jay and Anya began to move closer. Most of them were destroyed. Like ghosts of death, the skeletons reappeared from the shadows, surrounding the statue from every side. The statue had its two stone swords left floating just above its shoulders. They were ready to stab and slash at any moment. Jay was finally close enough to analyze the enemy. Dual Sword Whisperer, comma, level 8. HP 431. Slash 525. Armor. 0. Skills. Quint Counter. Pay the enemies back, 5 times over. 100% melee damage nullified. 500% damage returned. Swords essence comma passive. Whenever you swing, 4 ethereal swords strike after yours. 5% damage for the first sword. Add 5% for every other ether sword which strikes. The last sword does 30% damage. Ignore armor, can be blocked by mana shield. Blade dash. Sword swings you, instant repositioning. 8 second cooldown. Vow of the chosen blade. Recipient of a sacred vow. Soul bonded with your sword, comma s. Allow sword telekinesis. Can never touch another weapon, otherwise all swords will flee from you. Brittle armor. 40% damage reduction to slashing. Stabbing damage. 20% more damage taken from crushing damage. Holvisha's revenge. Magic damage immune. Any wielded weapons become cursed. Description. A dishonored servant of the Helvetian king, 
Its title and name removed, it body turned to stone. A once legendary quint blade, now cursed to never lift its swords again. At one time, it was one with its swords, but time passes, and the blades remain eternally out of reach. It longs to be one with its swords again, but they are no more turned to stone like everything else. It will never betray its lost companions by lifting another, and no other weapon will satisfy its soul. Wow. Good thing it was loyal to its weapons, otherwise this wouldn't end well Jay though, reading through its supreme sword abilities. I wonder if that's why it was dishonored. Being more loyal to its swords than its king. Jay scratched his chin. This one is like a complete opposite to Hesven the blacksmith. It throws swords away like trash, while Hesven held onto them until his bitter end. It doesn't end enemies in one hit, but locks them down and kills them slowly. Swoosh. Crack. The levitating swords span around its body like a fan. The skeletons couldn't even get close. Of course, they would keep trying and were slowly taking damage as they became more aggressive. Looks like it's our turn. Jay whispered to Anya. Anya nodded back with a smile as she mounted her crossbow onto a weapon rack and took aim. Chapter 174 Anya mounted her crossbow onto the top of a weapon rack and took aim. Sue. Funk. The bolt effortlessly pierced into the side of the statue's head with a critical hit, cracking its head sideways, and almost causing it to stumble. All the skeletons took advantage of the statue's brief state of pain, to move in closer and do some easy damage. They managed to get a few hits in, but the statue quickly recovered, and before its head was even upright, it was lucid enough to defend itself. The floating sword started to whirl once again, but not quickly enough as Blue and Sweeper were able to pass through and deal heavy damage. The two skeletons within the whirling swords forced the statue to alter its sword technique. It promptly thrusted its stone swords back and pierced Blue and Sweeper. However, this just meant that Red was able to hit it from behind. This was the least of the statue's problems though, as the threat of the heavy crossbow was still present shooting it from somewhere in the darkness among the weapon racks. It seemed annoyed as it suddenly grabbed Red with its gauntlet and tossed it into the path of one of its floating swords, before marching towards wherever the crossbow had fired from. The helpless skeleton bounced off and landed in a pile of debris. The statue was closing in on their location. Here we go, Jay said, raising his shield. Anya nodded. After reloading her crossbow, she mounted it on top of a weapon rack and fired again. Sue. Tring. The statue somehow blocked the bolt with one of its floating swords. Was that on purpose? Jay squinted. It was hard to tell in the darkness and the chaotically spinning swords, and Jay could only hope the statue wasn't that much of a sword master. Still, they technically outnumbered its 7 to 1. So master or not, it would not remain in this world much longer. As it drew nearer, the weapon racks were more dense, which proved to be an issue comer it couldn't spin its swords around its body anymore. The racks did act as barriers on either side though, so for it now had a sword defending its back from the skeletons, while one was at its front. Tell me when you're about to fire. Okay. Just before Anya shot, Jay made the decision to charge an unstable tooth spell and cast it. 5 seconds 3 dot dot 2 dot dot Anya counted down while taking aim again. Boom. Tat tat. Sue. Funk. 8. The statue didn't anticipate the small tooth to explode in its face, as it actually just seemed like a small rock. This allowed the second bolt to follow without interception, which it was now pierced through its cracking stone helmet. Nice. Jay smiled and nodded. Now that the statue was directly in front of them, Anya pulled out her orb, so they could see more clearly throughout the battle. The statue finally reached them. It would deal with the biggest threat first which it believed was on your comma it still hadn't connected the skeletons to Jay. Clang stab clang. Minus two minus ten minus two. Ugh. Jay gritted his teeth, he didn't expect it to attack so ferociously. The floating sword knocked Jay's shield away and stabbed into his shoulder before he could block again. It does piercing damage. He raised his shield as he backed up a bit. Jay wondered why the skeletons weren't assaulted as aggressively as he was, but after observing them, he soon understood the trick. He rushed forwards with even greater violence, his zeal only surpassed by the skeletons, as he started to strike furiously, after taking his final spare hammer from his inventory. Minus two. The foe had to use its swords for both attacking and defending, so Jay would merely force it to defend. Its tactic was like a double-edged sword. He deflected one blow as he charged in, 
But his plan was starting to pay off. Dunk, comma clang, comma dong. Neither the statue nor Jay were scoring any hits at this point. But that's exactly what Jay wanted. The only thing it could do was deflect his hammer away with a hovering sword. Before it could smash its body up. It remained stuck here as long as Jay swung his hammer at it wildly. At least, it would be a stalemate until Jay became too fatigued. However, Jay wasn't alone. Sue. Funk. Another bolt landed on the statue. A critical hit right in its face. Crack. Chip. Pebbles and flakes of stone broke away. The skeletons were attacking from behind, and since there were five of them, they were able to land a few occasional hits too. Unknown to Jay, the statue was actually trying to go for Anya, the highest damage dealer. But he managed to block its path, comma, he just naturally assumed he was the target. The statue would probably have launched a few swords at both of them already. If all of them weren't destroyed by the troublesome skeletons. It was a fearsome opponent before. But now it was just a matter of time before it fell in battle. Out of its 700 hit points. It had been whittled all the way down to only 130 now. Not much longer now Jay smiled. Knowing that the enemy's demise was drawing closer. Already the statue's armor was crumbling. Deep cracks and missing chips of stone were all over its body comma not to mention the three bolts sticking out of its head. Jay didn't need to check its health to know it was almost finished. As its health went below 100 the statue suddenly changed. Oh. Jay wondered what was happening. The feel of the fight suddenly felt different, more surreal. He felt like he sensed something he couldn't quite grasp. The statue shook its body and its stone armor all came off comma not that it was helping it much anyway. Suddenly its long claw-like gauntlet gripped the air. It was like the statue was trying to remember something as its focus was heightened. The atmosphere changed completely, despite the flying blades whirring around, and the skeletons continuing their attack. The battle went completely silent. It was like all the air had been sucked out of the room. No sound could pass. Crack. For a fraction of a second, a transparent, ghostly sword appeared in the statue's hand before disappearing again, replaced by a strange thickness of air. Sword visualization. Sword summoning. Jay guessed. Whatever it was, it felt wrong. That was Jay's only thought before it suddenly swung at Jay. V-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-
Jay flung one of his unstable teeth while it was looking for Anya again. He and the skeletons took advantage of every moment it paused. They were becoming quite an efficient killing force. The statue was slowing down, and weakness began to spread across its body. Its transparent ghostly sword disappeared as it dropped its arm to the side. The floating sword behind it got slower, and now the skeletons were taking full advantage of it as they smashed their hammers at it with no remorse or honor. Finally the statue dropped to its knees, collapsing, its floating sword dropping to the ground and shattering. 800x, Jay exhaled, it was finally over, it was slain. The skeletons were still smashing it and turning its body to chunks. But Jay ordered them to loot it first, bringing him the rewards. Greater Soul Stone, Empty, X1. Helvetian Ring, X8. Finally, another Greater Soul Stone. Jay smiled. I knew there would be one in this pyramid, oh, eight rings. Nice. Jay nodded. Anya ran back to Jay after she saw the statue fall. Here's your cut. Jay gave her four of the rings. Thanks. She nodded, looking over the statue. Jay looked a little more closely at the statue's gauntlets, as they seemed to be exotic compared to the other statues. But after touching and holding them closer, it was clear they were just stone, purely ornamental. He sent his feeble creature to grab his luminous orb, so he could see a little more clearly, as he looked around the rest of its body. Though there was nothing to grab, and nothing of use. Well, I'll see what the others have he looked around the room for the truth guards. Jay got two more Helvetian rings from them and checked over their bodies, recalling their ability to cast magical spells. There was a strange coating on them. It was extremely thin and see-through, but it felt smooth to the touch, similar to a varnished table. Jay tried to scratch some off, but it was of no use bringing a dagger out of his inventory. He finally managed to scrape a piece away, comma, but it suddenly evaporated into nothingness. Damn it, he pursed his lips. I guess this belongs to the truth guards even in death. He tossed the piece of stone he had scraped it off back to the ground. Alright, let's see how close I am to finishing this quest. Hidden quest, comma, soul liberation. Gather soul stones and bring them to Sedulous. Progress. Soul Stone, 420, slash 500, Large Soul Stone, 2, slash 2, Greater Soul Stone, 2, slash 3, Rewards, 3 Skills, Mind, Mark, Host, Weapon, Sedulous's War Spear. At first the quest rewards seemed really generous, but now it seemed like an appropriate reward for the hard work he put in. Jay wondered if it was somehow made harder because he asked for more rewards, but still, he had soloed most of the dungeon so far, so that would have naturally made it harder. Being a necromancer, he didn't have any idea how hard it would be for normal adventurers. There was no way to gauge it. Either way, he was managing it well. One more greater soul stone hum, and two more pyramids. Oh, Jay scratched his chin. Wait, fuck. Did Hesvan drop a greater soul stone? Damn it, he jumped into a fucking furnace. Jay kicked the remains on the truth guard in anger, only causing it to fall apart even more. Come to think of it, why did Hesvan have a name and this one didn't? Jay tilted his head and looked up in thought. Hum, I guess the sword whisperer was dishonored, so perhaps that's part of it. Oh, well he frowned with a shrug. Walking back to Anya, he was still a little disappointed after realizing there was no loot from Hesvan. Anya saw Jay with a solemn expression again after the battle, but again, she decided not to ask about it. After all, the choice to enter battle always came with the potential for personal sacrifice and hardship, but many never realize the choice of an action also comes with sacrifice. The skeletons were waiting next to the bone pile. Some were eating to recover health and armor, while Blue stood by and watched over them. Jay thought that he seemed like a worthy commander, watching over his troops while they went about their business. The pile got smaller, so Jay gave them a warm smile, and added more bones. Hey you aren't injured why are you eating? Jay gazed at the small skeleton. It neither made any sense that it would eat, since it didn't get the bone eater skill till level 3, but that's when he realized why. Oh, you leveled up. Good. Jay patted it. Anya grimaced a little seeing Jay patting the skeleton. There was something discomforting about it. As it ate, it grew before their eyes as its bones creaked, cracked and reformed. It was still below shoulder height, but much taller than it was. Well, I suppose I should name you. Jay looked around, dark. Or, no ceremony. Anya teased with a smile. 
Nope. You should never declare an assassin. It defeats the purpose, Jay said, as if it were a matter of fact. Anya shook her head with a smile as she looked at the young level 2 skeleton, twirling its jewel daggers. It seems like it's getting used to them again. Now that its body is bigger on your thought. Shouldn't be long till red levels up either, Jay said, hoping red would get an interesting role choice. The skeletons had already collected all their weapons, but Jay gave them another order to collect the bones, too, comma, he simply couldn't be bothered to go around and get them himself. The skeletons each scurried off into the dark corners of the room, each of them knew exactly where they had died, so it didn't take too long to collect their own remains, bringing them back and adding them to Jay's bone pile. Jay stood by waiting, and considered how he didn't realize the skeletons had leveled up. After all the skeletons were healthy and healed, and had gathered the bones, he gave them a new command. If any of you need bones, come to me. He squinted at them. Jay landed his eyes on Blue for a moment to make sure his order would be ingrained in their skeletal skulls. Blue was becoming a competent leader, and strangely, Jay felt a sense of trust growing in the skeleton, the trust in its reliability. Finally, Jay added the bone pile back into his gauntlet and gave his orb to Lamp, letting Dark continue to dual wield again. Hum, I wonder if Lamp gets a class from, well, literally being the Lamp Carrier he watched it for a moment as they walked to the back of the chamber. This is the end of this video. Once again go super our original author, who we all love AER0182. Next chapters are coming so subscribe to be noticed. Have a wonderful day and come again.